great to be here in sunny Tucson. Oh, it's so great to be in the sun again. It's, and especially to see this new location. I mean, this is, wow. Like I, I hadn't seen this spot in two years and you guys have done a lot of work. Yeah, well, uh, everybody knows this is the old Tucson Chamber of Commerce building and uh, we've spent the last 12 months just uh, just transforming it into uh, into the Tucson Fine Mineral Gallery. So welcome. Well, thank you. Thank it's you. great. And love your saguaro. It's Tucson. What else are we yeah. going to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got palm trees in the other direction, so yeah, it all works. Well, and you've got cool metal art on the side of the building. It's, uh, Some great gates. It looks really cool. And I'm looking forward to seeing what's inside. Yeah, well, inside we've um, we've got uh, eight or nine dealers now, some of the top dealers in the world. We're delighted to have a good chunk of the fine minerals in Tucson all together in one venue and down here at uh, near the old Inn Suites. And uh, we've got Fine Minerals International next door in the Granada Gallery. And with the great dealers in the inside the building here, we have you know, we, we really do have some of the best uh, best minerals at the whole show. So we should point out that the parking lot is empty right now because this is pretty early in the morning and <laughs> we're, we're here before the crowds get here. Yeah, well, that's the only way to go. It we've... was packed yesterday. You couldn't get in this parking lot. No, we've been uh, we've been overwhelmed by the response. It's been it's just been great. We've got uh, fresh food being cooked in the courtyard all day. We'll go and have a look at that in a minute. You're making me hungry. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get breakfast. Well, once we finish, we can go and have a bite. All right. Sounds yeah. good. Well, let's go. What a view to walk in on. I mean, you step into this space, you've got these really cool chandeliers and you have these giant geodes. I mean, yeah. they're bigger than the three of us, which is- Which is tough somebody. to do. Yeah. Which one is the in and which one is the yen? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we were very lucky to be able to get these. These, uh, as you well know, are a rarity in the, in the mineral world to get such a giant pair of geodes in perfect condition. And they're uh, great color. You know, we're in, look at the size. Yeah, uh, they, they set yeah. up perfectly for like a great photo <laughs> shot. <laughs> you know, are you gonna have weddings here in front of the geo? Oh yeah, we actually had uh, one of our staff is getting married here in November. So uh, Holy cow. This, uh, this will be a wedding venue through the year. And you know, we uh, <laughs> part of the design of this building was after the mineral show was to, uh, to keep using it all year. Yeah. So, so let's uh, look at your outside venue because that's part of what you've done here, right? It is. So we we're keeping a conference room here. So the conference room is uh, is going to be used all year round. And through the show, we'll be having talks and lectures here. Um, I think you so have lined, me lined up for a week from Monday. I, we do. Yeah. We do. Tell me what I'm supposed to call. <laughs> I'm sure he'll find something for that. <laughs> and this is our courtyard. So here we have a fully, uh, fully stocked restaurant every day. Uh, Brother John's from Tucson are doing the catering, and my gosh, is it good food. Yeah, it really is. And on top of that, you have this lovely seating area over here where people can relax, but they're in open air conditions, so they can really kind of enjoy the space and enjoy the moment and catch up with people. And it's really beautiful. This, is what, uh, this is what we've been missing in the middle world forever. It's a central spot for everyone to just come and enjoy and relax and, and uh, have some good food. We'll be doing a lot of functions here through the shows. And uh, I really want to show you my grill. This is something that I love. Everybody that knows me know that I love to do barbecue, so. Yeah, well, let's see it. So this is, uh, this is our, this is our little, uh, our little outdoor kitchen. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we have rotisserie chickens going there <laughs> through the day, and um, it's, it's great. These guys do a wonderful job. Wonderful. Who would have thought in true baronial fashion you'd have a roast pigs turning on that spit? Well, next year, I, I believe the guys from the Munich show are, are going to do some um, some uh, Schwe Schweinshacks in there, uh -huh. and a suckling pig. So uh, right. watch, out for, watch out for next year's parties. Well, I got to say, I think as the mineral communities, uh, I don't know if spoils the right term, but we're definitely lucky to have this amazing food and space to congregate. Wow, Ian, what an entrance. Like you walk into this space, but it feels like you're going into like a museum underground treasure trove. I, I really love it. Great. Other than the fact that there's no dust, this is like going back into that 1860s <laughs> little store somewhere downtown London with 
phenomenal rocks expecting you're going to open the drawers and there are going to be all these amazing things from Cornwall hiding. Well, this is, uh, this is the, the, the uh, Crystal Classics version of how a mineral gallery should be. And uh -huh. it's, uh, as you say, it's based on how it used to be. And uh, um, so for instance, look, these cases were made in uh, some of these, we have cases dating back to the mid 1800s here. Oh, wow. This, uh, this set here, this was made for James Gregory, the uh, famous mineral dealer in London in the, the mid 1800s and uh, late 1800s. And um, they were made specifically for his showroom. And I have a picture of uh, these cases, the same cases full of minerals in, this, in his showroom in the late 1800s in, uh, in, in London, which is, it was fantastic. So my Great dad was these. right. It really is like walking into it, it really a is. Yeah. 1800s mineral sales room. So. Well, I mean, and, and the next thing you see down the road is this amazing bar case. I mean, I've, I've never seen a spar construction that big or elaborate. No, and uh, for those that don't know, these um, this is an, an old spar column from... Uh, from, uh, from the north of England. And this was a big tradition in the north of England in the late, mid to late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, the miners in their spare time would often make these and, and sell them. And this one was made in the uh, Agramont area in uh, Cumbria, northern England, um, late 1800s. And it's uh, all the specimens in here, there are thousands of mineral specimens. And uh, they've all been constructed into this uh, this tower-like uh, piece of art. And um, all, the, all the specimens you've got, hema, specular hematite, smoky quartz, there's a there's aragonite, there's dolomite, there's calcite, all the species you would expect to find from those iron mines yeah. um, of, of, that, uh, of that time period. This is the largest one known, and uh, it's quite remarkable it survived because very few of them did survive. Where did you find it? Uh, this belonged to uh, David and Liz Hacker, oh. um, some of our really close right. friends, and they'd yeah. had it for years, and uh, they um, they thought it uh, very apt that they, they sent it to me, so... It's, no, it's, um, it's, it's a spectacular, literal capsule of history, both of the mining district, but also of the culture that comes and surrounds and forms around these mining districts as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, part of, uh, part of what we tried to do in this gallery is it's not just about minerals for sale so it's about education as well and uh, that's why we've kept up that great room as a conference room just so that people you know we're not all about selling minerals we want people to learn about minerals and you know we like to talk about them as everybody knows um, and mining history is a mining and mineral specimen history is very very important yeah so you know in our showroom we have all the crystal models around mm -hmm. from the uh, made by Krantz um, in the late 1800s, you know, these, uh, these things are wonderful. Look at that. Wow. And again, very few of them survived because, you know, the, the universities and uh, schools that used them back then perhaps don't teach mineralogy little... anymore and they end up getting thrown in the, in the, uh, in the trash, which is a real shame. But we, we collect them and, uh, That's we, fantastic. Try and we try and save them. So, um, you know, what showroom would be complete without a picture of one of the, uh, the early gods of mineralogy? And uh, here we have, uh, you know, this is a, a very early picture of um, Howie, one of, the, uh, one of the forefathers of modern mineralogy. You know, these yeah. guys were so smart and, you know, it's important for us to remember that, you know, you know they, they helped create our whole world, you know, the, the, the world of modern mineralogy. Yeah. Um, we buy so many mineral collections worldwide that typically when, uh, whenever you buy a, a nice old collection, there'll always be some part of history, mining lamps or crystal models or, or you know, some sort of mineral related mining art. And uh, we, uh, we end up keeping it, you know, it's just, it's just a great piece of history. And uh, we're very proud to be able to share it with everyone here. So um, you, you know my passion for Sumeb. Um, I, I, you know, I've heard a little bit about it. <laughs> Not an inkling somewhere. <laughs> So Sumeb is very dear to us, um, to me personally, and to us as a company. We, you know, we one of our big specialities is uh, Sumeb minerals, um, and over the years we've handled most of the big Sumeb collections that have come to market. And occasionally you'll you'll find a, a, a collection with again great history, and uh, 
one of the great collections we bought was in in, um, in Cape Town some years ago, and uh, uh, we. Uh, as part of that collection, we ended up getting some great memorabilia, and I'm going to walk just back here to show you something that's that's wonderful. You know, this is a snapshot in time, and it's uh, it just shows what a pain in the ass mineral collecting can be for mining companies. So Brian has to come around and, and uh, just focus on this this little letter. This little letter was um, this little letter was uh, to all the miners and workers at the Sumed mine in 1974. The uh, general manager was. Uh, was a guy called uh, Mr. Ratledge, and um, it, uh, it was very apparent to them that the uh, amount of specimens that was coming out of the mine was becoming a real pain because they were going through at that time. The uh, um, just before the dioptase started coming out in the second oxidization level, mm -hmm. and uh, they had huge amounts of super fine specimens. And here he is writing to all his staff, just saying that um, guys, just please stop taking all the specimens and do some work because you can imagine what a problem it became for the mining company because every time they blasted there was a new cavity of specimens and here we are 1974 please stop collecting mineral specimens and just throw them all in the crush and we need the ore so what, one of the other great things that uh, we're, we're very proud of is uh, back in the late 90s when uh, the when the sumeb mine went bankrupt as part of the sumeb corporation we uh, we took the lease on the mine for a couple of years to try and reopen it for specimens and uh, during that time, we, uh, you know, we looked very carefully at the upper levels where a lot of the best things came from. And these are the original, um, the original mine maps, which are just, just outstanding from the upper levels. So dating from the, the early, early 1900s up to about, I think, 19, to mid 1920s. And it's great to just imagine the amount of mineral specimens that came out of this block of ore um, from surface down to about eight levels more or less the the, uh, the richest part of the, the upper oxide zone and um, when you read the old reports about what they found and uh, some of the structures in the upper the upper uh, ore body it's incredible there are two big there were two big remobilized um, um, super gene structures there the Hagenstrom and the Bogenstrom and um, the uh, when you read the old reports they were mining mimetite ore and and azurite ore you know super rich high grade things and it was straight to the smelter you know it was oh, uh, so rich oh my gosh we will never know you know we will never know but uh what we can do now is read the old reports and just think oh no well someplace like milpias actually gives you an idea of what that was because yeah. that was one that came into production in 2006 closed basically having exhausted the oxide zone by 2000 by 2020 yep and so amazing things got out a fraction of what there was yep and the rest is just something copper wire <laughs> yeah, or something for our fervent imaginations to uh to think about yeah so before we look at minerals i know lauren's getting really really you gotta uh, show us the rest really of excited yes, yes. here we're going to look around at uh, the rest of the gallery. So every every good mineral showroom needs to have uh, a bar. have its own English bar. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the uh, this is part of what we like to do, so people can come here and then just enjoy the experience. We have you know we have fresh coffee and uh, uh, water and um, some nice wines and things. So it's uh, you know it's just part of it's just part of who we are and what we like to. What we like to share with everyone it's fun i know peter's tried a few so yeah. it's definitely bringing the english element here and i love how this gives you a feeling of like a space that you can really enjoy and also inspire you know it's like a pinterest board you can it can inspire your own home as well and that's part of it you know in integrating nice mineral specimens into the home is uh, when it's done right it's, it can just look great so this year we decided to uh, to recreate a home environment and uh, just just show people what our vision of our home environment is and uh, those of you who have been to England know very well that uh, this is this is kind of how our um, our own place looks like mm -hmm. so uh, and i love like well you know i have a personal bias towards santo lalia but i love these calcites that are in here and the way that they intermix with the mineral books and I'm obviously partial to mineral books and the, the kind of the way that they integrate the, the history and the knowledge and can open them up and share them with people to show what's possible when you have something like this, which inspires friends when they visit, Yeah, they get to see it. It's, this is fantastic. 
Yeah, I'm glad you like it. And uh, you know, again, every uh, every good mineral showroom should have a a, 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 a a private area to show maybe some things that are just just lovely. So uh, my prize specimen is in here. Let's go and see. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, the secret door. Oh, hey. There's got to be spooky music playing in the back. <laughs> and here she is, my prize, okay, spe yeah. my prize oh, specimen. Yeah. <laughs> and the lock and key so nobody can access. <laughs> well, come on in. It's just finished. We tidied it up so you can see really all the wonderful treasures that oh, we have wow. hidden and more comfortable furniture for hanging out. Oh yes, oh yes. All right. Never too many Chesterfields around. <laughs> so um, in these cases are just some, uh, some lovely specimens. We were very fortunate to, um, to have picked up a couple of very good collections since Munich, the Munich show. And uh, we uh, were presenting for the first time the collection of uh, Michael, uh, Michael Gunther who was one of our customers for about 30 years in Germany. And uh, he and his brother, Martin, put together one of the finer collections ever put together in Europe. And uh, they had impeccable taste, impeccable knowledge, and uh, an incredible collection of fine, fine display quality rarities and uh, oh. old classics. A lot of great history here. Um, a lot of things that uh, normally you don't see on the market. So it's... Um, there's a lot to look at in here. Absolutely. I think one of my favorites must be the Iranian specimen up there. Easily overlooked, but... Yeah. Oh, the, the green? How do you miss that? Well, no, not the green, but the locality of it. So with, without knowing, because they're so rare, you don't really see them. So you just think, oh, right, that's another androdite, you know, but locality is important on this specimen. I think it would be special without being from Iran, and then being from Iran, it makes it like that much more. Yes, more. definitely, definitely. Wow. Yeah, so it really is one of the nicer Uvarovite garnets we've seen from uh, from Iran. It's uh, it's a beautiful thing. Big, well-formed crystals. Very rare to get something this quality from there. I also love how it gets almost that like grass green as you get towards the edges of the terminations. Makes it have even more of a three-dimensional aspect to it. It's a, a beautiful thing. Um, we've always seen them for sale, but uh, I've only ever seen two great ones. There was one in the Ed David collection. He had a beautiful one. And, uh, and this one are the only two really good ones I've, I've come across. Um, and I agree with you, Lauren. It's, uh, it's a real shame we have these political boundaries at the moment because some of the... Um, some of the mineralogy of the ore fields in Iran are just outstanding. Some of the world's best supergene minerals. And oh, I, I think in the next uh, hundred years, hopefully as things uh, settle down in the Middle East, we might see some good production from that, uh, yeah. that part of the world because the ore deposits and the mineral specimen deposits there are just some of the best in the world. So I love that manganite. I mean, normally you see some good ones around, but normally the crystals are all parallel. But that's got some divergence, so it yeah, really like gives it a little this more This is wonderful. Diana, can, Diana, Diana knows all about manganite. She can talk about this. Really? I can? No. I just have totally to agree with Peter because it is really more sprayed, more fanned out, rather than sort of those blocky, straight, closed groups together. Mm -hmm. So you can really see every individual crystal on that specimen and the luster is just absolutely off the charts. I was going to say it understood the assignment. Yeah. And went full bore on the butt luster. Yeah, it made an effort, you know. <laughs> yeah, over the years, it's uh, one, one of the nicer ones we've had. So, so that would have come out quite a long time ago. Yeah, this is late 1800s. Yeah. It's um, and it's in great condition. Yeah. My gosh, you know, some this has been well loved, and yeah. it's just a beautiful so thing. So many have just the damage right in the middle, or you know, the, the broken yeah. crystals on the side. But this one really, really is the perfect size specimen. This is uh, this is a real rarity. It's um, it is from the Clara mine. Uh, Peter wishes it was a Mexican one, but it's uh, you know it's one of the few places in the world you get great scorodites and uh, the Clara mine, and they're so rare from there. This is this is beautiful from uh, from this barite mine in the Black Forest. Um, it produced some of the world's best scorodites of all things. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And in daylight, this the color of this is just magnificent. Mm -hmm. uh, 
one of the first things that my eye was drawn to in this oh. case. And I said one of. One of. One of. Well, one of the other ones that got me was the Parosmolite from Sweden. That's a spectacular classic. Uh -huh. Yeah, how often, how often do you see a good one of those for sale? It's, uh, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to get one. And it's one of the nicer ones I've had in 30 years of dealing. It's, it's just a great thing. Big, big crystal. And these are these are from Sweden, from uh, from Nordmark. And yeah. It's um, just impossible to get a good one. The depth of the Gunter collection was just, you know, incredible. It's a, a, a pleasure to be handling it. I've done some consulting in this neighborhood. I never saw anything like this. I'll have to go back. <laughs> and this is another great Swedish classic from uh, from the iron mines up in uh, up in northern Sweden. It's uh, a strangite and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Very rich, great condition, and great color. Great Fantastic color. color. Yeah. What are the little blue balls? It's uh, it's rock bridgeite. Rock bridgeite. Yeah. Okay. So they're iron phosphates, really, uh, really a great combo. What a combo. I mean, yeah. you, you get the aesthetics from a weird locality, a rare mineral, and it even still pops in the case with all of these other amazing things in that. It's not little purple balls from Sulawesi. It's actually <laughs> a complicated mineral from an interesting locality. And this is another great, great, great German classic from uh, from the Samson mine, the silver mine, famous silver mine that produced all the great uh, perodurites and uh, in Germany, and uh, pink apophyllite, very similar to the San Martin to the San Martin, San Martin or uh, Guanajuato yeah. or Nica. Exactly, it's, um, yeah. a great Same European classic, late 1800s again, yeah. and this is again one of the finest we've ever had. Gorgeous. I love how gemmy the terminations are. So they add this extra element of depth and sparkle and that is a cool piece. So these are again some of the uh the Mikael Gunter that collection pieces and this Proust I, you have such a good eye, Lauren. I love Who Proust. taught you about, who taught you about minerals? <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> that is such a great piece. And it's Czech Republic, right? And it's Czech Republic, yeah. Two five it's, uh, as well. I know. <laughs> I can dream. And this is just wonderful, you know, to get a, an undamaged mm -hmm. large equant. Mm -hmm. oh, oh. Yeah, you yeah. get yeah. still the really red yeah, fire. Really red yeah. in there still. Yeah. Wow. And it's great with a nice old label. Look at that. Wow. Look at that. Here, I'll, I'll let you hold that or... Just a second, let me put the flashlight down so I'm not trying to do two things at once. Wow. The calcopyrite on the back? It's like a little dust. Yeah, a little like dusting that. of calcopyrite. That is spectacular. This is just wonderful. This is wonderful. Have you ever seen anything like that? In my dreams. Incredible. So you've got a wire copper, crystallized wire copper, nice little bit of matrix there. And on top, you've got this huge gr bunch of grape-like native silver crystals from, uh, from Michigan. Again, 19th century specimen, super well formed. Look at the size of these silver crystals. I am obsessed with these, uh, what we used to call half-breeds, the, the, the copper-silver combos. The, the geochemistry and the formation that's required for this, and just, oh, I love it. Yeah, it's one of the nicest half-breeds I've ever seen, especially the combination of those huge silver crystals with the, uh, with the copper wire. You know, we've resist, resisted every temptation to overclean it. You know, to, in today's market, so many specimens get overcleaned, and we chose just to keep it as it was. You know, nice natural patina and the patina on the, the silver is lovely. Yeah. too. Yeah. This is uh, this is a lovely specimen. Love how you see. You know, when you look at it, you get the the different aspects of the crystals and. The hoppered growth with the terminations. Yeah, lovely, lovely perodurite from uh, from Saxony, from Schlima, the town where my wife was born. It's a uh, it's a great, great, great crystal group. And the little the little uh, tunnel that goes through the side there. 
So you can see how the crystals formed up. Yeah. And this is another another specimen from uh, from Saxony, from the Erzgebirge, a fabulous stephanite group, um, three dimensional, great condition. Again, something you just never see for sale. It's uh, it, this is wonderful. I love that, you know, that main central crystal and almost wings coming off of it. Yeah. And it's stephanite. So. And it's stephanite. Mm -hmm. So this is. Um, this is a relatively new find. They came out a couple of years ago. It's from uh, from Juan uh, Juanani mine in uh, Bolivia. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, important find of uh, very nicely formed ludlamite crystals. So another another iron phosphate. Um, pretty rare to get a good display specimen, and this is just as lovely. And the matrix even adds into the way that it uh, kind of makes you think of like a sea creature almost. Yeah, it's like a little nest of siderites. Classic association with the uh, ludlamite from pretty much anywhere you find it. That's great color. Great little rarities here, as well as some uh, classics and uh, some, some nice display specimens as well. A very tiny wolfenite. Very Sumer. tiny wolfenite from Sumer. Yeah, it's one yeah. of the larger crystals known from there. It's, uh, it's great. This is lovely. Look at this. This uh, this would have come from the upper oxide zone, um, somewhere in those four maps we looked at earlier. This uh, this specimen would have been hiding, and uh, somebody saved it in the early 1900s. Classic upper oxide zone. Beautiful, beautiful combination of colours and forms with the azurite crystals. Uh, Sumer, but it's best. You've got the Baeldonite pseudomorphing earlier generations of um, probably azurite, uh, gartrelite, this yellow. Mm -hmm. Matrix here. What a dream combo. Look at the colors. Yeah, and the uh, casts as well. The casts, yeah. Epimorphous. It's, uh, it's lovely. And it's got that true blue. It's not like the, the black style uh, yeah. Sumer of Azurites. It's got that flash that we almost expect these days from something like Milpias. Milpias, yeah. Here we have it from a classic Sumer piece. Yeah, with the, you know, the arsenate associations. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Some really interesting oriented growth here of micro crystals coming through part of the main crystal, but you can see all the crystal faces lining up and giving you a flash at the same time. So it's, even though they're separate, they're all part of the same mother crystal, if you will. Very, Very cool. cool. So one more specimen from this cabinet and uh, we'll move move to the outside. This is something I've never had, a, I've never had a good one of these before. It's, uh, they're from Namibia, the Aris quarries. Viliormite, and it's um, it's, it's a gemmy. very very rare one. This big gemmy crystals. Yeah. I've never had a good one before, and this is uh, this is wonderful. What is the chemistry behind this? It is quite a rare. It's got manganese in it. Is it, it's is it a <laughs> fluoride? Let's have a look. Let's uh, go, go to the yeah. good old Mindat website because uh, it is a, a big rarity. It's a, comp it's a complex. Uh, it's going to be common black. Yeah. Yeah. What would we do without um, Mindat? So it's a rare halide, um, basically sodium fluoride. Wow. Is yeah. it? That, that so picture it, almost looks like it. It does. So yeah, sodium okay. fluoride. So uh, it's um, incredibly rare. You'd never guess where that crist finely crystallized gold is from. It's, uh, it's historic. It, was, uh, it dates back to the early 1800s. So that means not California? It means not California. So uh, this this specimen came from a, um, a collection I bought originally in England, and um, this this guy had accumulated a f super fine collection of old old classics, and everything had lovely old labels, and it was an incredible story because it was a name I'd always heard of, and I'd never met this guy. And one day we had a call in the office, uh, Ian, can you please come and uh, come and have a look at this collection? So I drove up to. Uh, to where this guy lived and um you know usually when you pull up to a house you can you know in your head you can kind of gauge how you think the collection is going to be so i pulled up in front of this uh this guy's house and uh it was a very very modest house and um it really was not in a nice neighborhood and i thought mm, well you know i've heard of the guy's name let's go and have a look so i walked into uh, not into the house but into his garage and in this garage there were a whole bank of these little metal drawers, little filing cabinet drawers, and I thought, okay, well, let's have a look. 
And as I went, started opening the drawers and pulling out uh, drawer after drawer, I, it's one of the best mineral collections I've ever seen in a garage. In wow. this cold, damn garage. It was, there were probably 20 or 30 drawers of some of the best mineral specimens I've ever seen. Wow. And uh, this, this was one of them. And it, uh, it's from Brazil. It's from, uh, it's from Moravea. So a very, very, you know, very, very old, very, very old location. Um, the only good specimen I've ever seen from there. Very crystal, you know, nicely crystallized. You know, when you were talking, I thought you were going to say, oh, it's Cornwall. Or... No, no, we never got gold quite like that in Cornwall. Yeah, a little more reticulated. Yeah. So let's go and play in the main showroom. And uh, there's good. a lot to show you in there. Wow. In this showroom, everything is themed. Um, there are uh, just over 15,000 good mineral specimens here in, in the, the, the cases and the drawers. And um, it's only when I, I was speaking to a museum curator a few weeks ago and uh, she, uh, I showed her pictures of the gallery and, and she, she really made me think. She said, how many mineral specimens do you have in here? And I said, well, I can look it up on the computer and tell you exactly. And it was just over 15,000 specimens to fill this space. And she said, Ian, you do realize that most national collections are, have collections in the 10 to 20,000 range to be a good collection and and uh, it really made me think you know it's um we're very proud to have this stock it's it's very varied um it's not all just modern chinese minerals it's uh you know there's a real depth here and it's as you walk around all the different cases are themed um we don't have everything but you know we uh we try we try so most of the old classic locations and new classic locations is a good representation of everything. It depends on what collections come in. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons to, to maintain something like this. You guys make such an emphasis on acquiring older collections and re acquiring the whole thing in context so that way they can really be together and you can share that with people and uh, hopefully find those specimens in new homes too. And, and your ultimate goal is that this is going to be open year round by so, appointment or whatever but basically yeah. no our, be um, this will become our the new crystal classics head office will be based here in tucson um we have some very very nice uh, tucson staff now um we'll uh, we'll be open nine to five monday to tuesday every day and um it's uh, every day during the week yeah monday to friday and uh we uh more and more, this Tucson will become our, our home for Crystal Classics. These are worldwide fluorites. Uh, most, uh, one of the most collectible species on the planet, as you well know. Um, just about every mineral collection we ever get has uh, fluorites of some, some description in them. Um, people, people love them and it's amazing. Well, uh, and you dig a few yourself, as I remember. We do, we have a few. A few fluorites from our own mines in here. Um, this is from a brand new pocket, which we call the Hidden Forest Pocket. And it's, uh, I don't know if you can get the zoning in there, but um, these, uh, is this pocket is right on the intersection of the Greenbank Vein and the Sutcliffe Vein up in Weirdale in Durham, um, the Diana Maria mine. And uh, you get quite a lot of zoning in these. So you get a purple cord and a yellow band and then, and then green. So these are, uh, these are hot off the press. They've been very popular. So what better person to talk about Diana Maria fluorites than, than Diana Maria herself? Ha ha! <laughs> so uh, why, don't, uh, why don't I hand over to you and uh, you can continue the voyage. The voyage into the mines. <laughs> <laughs> so should we... Classic Nica octahedron built up of cube octahedrons that all go to make this giant composite crystal. And in this particular case, with calcopyrite inclusions there's probably a liquid bubble in there somewhere if you look around just really architectural the way those specimens build and up like that even though it can't maybe sort of win you over with with the lack of color but certainly with the composition and the way that is really geometrically shaped this specimen yeah. that should be a real draw yeah. what is the elongate crystal in there probably arsenopyrite but the other thing that I'd point out about something like this is NICA is a carbonate replacement deposit. I've, I've got it. Just and so this, <laughs> so this basic shape of the buildup of the octahedron with the subsidiary crystals, you can put this right up next 
to yes. this Chinese specimen, which comes from a very similar geologic environment, and it's exactly the same style of buildup of that crystal. Yes. So just by knowing a little bit about the deposit type and the crystals it form, it lets you make the link from Mexico to China to Eastern Europe to a number of different places. And mentioning Europe again, I think one of the really interesting specimens here, old, is this really nice Italian. Italian? Italian. Italian. Yes. What about it, man? Zoning there. The phantoms and zoning, yeah. yes. So, again, might not be the most attractive one for color or lack of color, but certainly the locality where it's from yeah. is something that gets hearts racing yeah. when you're a fluoride enthusiast. Well, this is another one of this uh, theme that runs through this gallery of European classics. Uh, this isn't the kind of thing you see. I mean, I'm not sure I've seen another one in, outside of a museum in 40 years ago. Sure, sure. There you go. <laughs> well, before we get completely lost in fluorite, can we move on to some silicates? Oh, yes. <laughs> we can do something different. But we can look at another thing that's very colorful. Yes, another thing, colorful. Well, we might even find the famous hot pink that Lauren really likes. Right, colorful. Well, what's not to like about... Blues, pinks, greens, reds. And it's, it's great to finally get to see these hot pink tourmalines cleaned up and together. And obviously quite a few of them managed to find their ways to new homes. But the color really is incredible. The color still is really incredible. And, and it has not ceased to amaze us uh, with obviously the zonings. And, and as we described once, when you were there, when we found this, and had it delivered. I mean, do you just look at this one and you have really those, I hope we can get it. Do you really have sort of a sherry color through to a pale yellow, green, blue, pink, and then I don't even know what you call this, like carmine yeah. red? Cranberry. Yeah, cranberry. And you look at so. one specimen I really want to point out is this new find, the mm. Morganites. So super cute. Again, Lauren, Lauren will love this size. Yeah. Matches her shirt. Ma this is... A sharp, sharp crystal. Highly modified. And intense. I mean, it's not a pale pink, although the crystal is relatively small. It's really nice. I love how this line of terminations has that matte aspect, which really makes the luster on the other terminations stand out. It's a really cool piece. It fit perfectly in my collection. Although this little flora appetite's pretty cute too. I thought you would uh, would notice that straight away. I mean, remember localities. This one's from Golconda. In Brazil. In Brazil, and just that purple to yeah, blue transition. I just want to say, I hope the camera captures this purple, almost pinkish hue that's within the crystal. Yeah, I mean, the, it's almost like the base is sort of a pink, like pink, almost magenta deep to purple, and then at the top, it's sort of that teal blue that's my favorite color. I don't watch out. I'm gonna <laughs> fall in love with this piece. <laughs> we continue, and I think what's important is to point out maybe the specimens that are not instantly sort of the most flashiest specimen. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> totally. So you have to Whoa. pull in with quartz, really, from Myanmar, so, which is like, I don't even try to pronounce the mine because it only can sound wrong unless somebody wants to make a go <laughs> make an attempt. So, but Aye. how can you, so rare, you hardly ever see a specimen like it, let alone this little group. This is really a perfect miniature specimen. And also just the way that it sits there with that big fan kind of coming out of the quartz. Yeah, a really nice group, not Although, just I a guess, single crystal, yes. In this case, it'd be the quartz is growing around it, but optically it looks like it's coming out of the quartz. Yes, yes, it does. You look at things like the tourmaline from Pop Rock here, and you look at this blue, this glow. I mean, it looks almost like it, the iridescence in the top layer of the crystal. That's magnificent. So, and they might not be the ones that you instantly are drawn to when you walk into the room, but they are the ones really when you spend time, 
but have to detail. That blue looks like the electric blue you get on some butterfly wing. Totally, yes, yes. Is yeah, this is from Namibia. Yes, it's a Namibian tourmaline. And just that blue is absolutely ridiculous, but I guess what I was about to say is that's one of the special things about your gallery is you guys have, you know, those standout, knocks you out from across the room specimens in the same case. It's the one where you have to look a little bit closer. Well, and, it's certainly uh, not just the 10 species that everybody <laughs> knows that you find in our showroom. It is really the accumulation of uh, locations and locality specimens and species that brings it all together. So you can probably visit every day for seven days a week and still notice specimens that you have not noticed before and finding something is i remember yesterday having someone in the showroom say oh you don't have specimens from japan and i'm like that's not true we do have specimens from japan and that possibly should make us go over to the next case and actually look at some of the specimens that we have put together in this little grouping Fantastic. although not plentiful we do have that variety to offer as well so we're moving on to asia so and not only Japan is, is on the cards, like this grouping, and there's one specimen in particular that I find is interesting, not only from a locality aspect, also from the historic aspect. So you have this chalcopy, right, from Ani Mine, from Japan. And maybe, Lauren, if you hold the specimen and show it to Brian, then we can get delve into the little label. Get a little deeper in, into the light. Right? Is that better, Brian? Yeah. So, and they come really with these historic labels. Oh, wow. So and that is really something that we emphasize a lot when we buy collections to keep the history intact, to getting those labels with the specimens, keeping that together to really show this is not something that's just mined yesterday or last year. This is historic. And as you go through this case, there's so many things to point out. I mean, obviously, the obvious location like uh, locations like China, Afghanistan, um, but then you have also um, really, really nice, I mean, from China, what's not to love about the acanthite? I'm, I'm surprised you haven't spotted this straight away. Well, we, we were focusing it's sort down on Japan, so your I, I, I had to... Your, your eye level. <laughs> <laughs> so things, things like this are just like, Oi, what's this? So from Honda like Mine in China. There's little silver crystals on there too. Could well be. It does, Over here it in does, the corner, these little guys. Uh, here, yeah. Yeah. Is that better, Brian? Mm -hmm. These little silver crystals in here is what they look like. Probably wires rather than crystals. Yeah, they look like, yeah, they look a little more wiry. And Very to slightly desulfidized. <laughs> so you release the silver and grow little wires of silver on the acanthite. Calcasite from Kazakhstan. I don't think I have seen one before. It's very cute. <laughs> the journey around the world continues and we arrived in Australia. And in Australia, we obviously see within this case a lot of Broken Hill specimens. Broken Hill probably one of the more better known locations within Australia for specimens that produce really um, all kinds of minerals. So you look at cerucites, you look at spessartines, wolfenites. So really a huge variety of specimens. Things that might be less well known are things like this cuprite from Moon Muntamine. So this is probably something that you do not see on an everyday browse through a mineral gallery. <laughs> no. Or even the, the Atacan light from Mount Gunnison. Let's, let's get a little bit of oh. light through that Does it... right if we can. No. No. It says no. Enough. Cooperite says no. Cooperite says, well, I'm getting a little bit of flashes on the sides. <laughs> so we have here the specimen with yeah. the wolfenite crystals here in the corner. That's some of the best coverage of Wol Wim Creek wolfenite I think I've ever seen. And then rightly pointed out by Lauren, the Atacarmite from Mount Gunsen Mine. 
with the nice, like in a wuggy sort of matrix and then the spray is coming out. Looks like it could be from a whaler. It could, yes, yeah. <laughs> you have just a one track mind. And again, I mean, for those that don't know, but this is not just something you pick up just at a one-off purchase. It's, it's really an accumulation of collections, of, of buying, constantly traveling, sourcing, um, that this can be put together and put on display. So it, it does look like, oh, well, they just have a whole case of Australian minerals, but it's not just there, and you don't just come across these things. And um, the Broken Hill collection actually was put together um, over many, many, many years. So we did buy this as a rather a bulk collection with the Broken Hill. Um, but even that took 50 plus years to put together. Yeah. We are going and landed now in Romania. Oh. So, so we get some gold. We get some gold. Yes. And some Hessites. Mm -hmm. And some Nagiagite. So. Maybe we start with the top shelf, okay. where we really do have, obviously, already a few gold specimens here and there. One of my favorites in the case must be the Kronzodite on Ciderite from Herja Mine. This perfect bowl, this is really it's perfectly perched on top. So that must be really one of those classics. And the Ciderite blades are actually very sharp, so they're not just rough. It's yeah. really crystalline little blades of ciderite, which make it even more attractive, the contrast of the sort of coppery brown ciderite. Plus the, the luster on the cronstadite and all those little facets as they glitter as well. I really like this piece. This is one of the few pieces, like this is one of the pieces I really noticed yesterday as I was walking around. <laughs> And then it continues really within the case. I mean, you have the Nagi Agate here from Scarab Mine, or you look you look at any of the Nagi Agates. I mean, you, yeah. you, pick one, two, two, pull out and, and have a closer look. Pick one of the hair sites that's on display. Um, there's just too many to choose from, but never enough to look at, you know? Right. And, and the fact that you have multiple of those species in a case is special in of itself. Yes, because it also shows it's not one like the other. You, you really have to look, and you could just have several specimens of Nagi Agate from the same location, but they look all different, and yeah. they all have a different, like, attractiveness. So, so tell us about these pieces on the bottom that have these very distinctive historic labels. The very distinctive uh, historic labels. So... Often, so these labels are from Archduke Stefan. So, and he put together in the uh, 19th century one of the most complex collections that ever existed. So at one point it was talked about 35,000 specimens that he put together. Wow. Um, but what happened is, um, unfortunately, when he died, the collection was uh, laying unattended in his castle for almost 10 years. So wow. nobody really took care of it. And Rumpf then acquired that collection. So Rumpf uh, was also a mineral enthusiast. And he then took labor of love, applied little labels, and described them all. And uh, after Rumpf had barely a year time to process this collection. And it was then moved into uh, Berlin. The Berlin National History Museum acquired the collection. And it was donated by Rumpf in his will. And what they've done, so you see some labels are really nice and, and they're complete as we put, uh, positioned them here, but some were cut to size because Berlin had simply not the space <laughs> to fit the, la the labels that usually were then much larger than the specimens, so they just cut them down. So not many of those labels have actually survived. Um, and that is really sort of the, the, the history about these uh, specimens. And as the... Um, as we enter sort of the uh, First World War, a lot of specimens were destroyed, the museum was bombed, so, so not a lot of specimens have actually survived in that collection, Ooh. let alone being dispersed into private collections. Sorry, my, my eye keeps getting caught by this uh, specimen here, and if I can get it with its base. And I realize this means I'm taking us off the, the topic of that Get yes, back to the really attractive specimens. Get back to the gold. Yes. Well, just uh, the, the way that these almost 
laid feather, feather is not quite the right word, but these plates of gold. They're really cool and it's so fragile looking. It is and it isn't, I mean. But that's that's the thing about gold is it, it, it has some robust aspects to it, despite the fact that it looks like if you look at it funny, Yes. The, the 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 petals as they were are gonna And that's one of the beauties about minerals. I mean this is a piece from Romania and you know you have these specimens that are older. Yes. And we can appreciate them in the same way, unlike say flowers where the plants probably died a while back. Yes. But it is interesting beauty. to see, sort of, just when you look at this one location, they might not be the most attractive if you compare them to Californian golds, mm -hmm. but it gives you a, a glimpse, sort of, that is the quality that those locations have been able to produce. It puts it, and it is the, the difference, obviously, looks wise to the nice, shiny mm -hmm. Californian ones, but it is making you not appreciate them less. Well, but if you're a gold collector, you have to have some specimens from Romania. It's one of the classic localities for gold, and uh, so it needs representation. But this is like a wine drinker. You can't just drink new world wines, you have to drink old world as well. Classics. So, South America, here we go. A couple more of the new Ludlamites in there. Yes. So I think another one to point out is definitely the Gratonite from Terra de Pasco mm -hmm. from Peru. Type locality. Yeah. And cute. Cuter than I don't... Lewis Carl Groton was, that's for sure. <laughs> See, but only a true mineral lover can say this is cute because the majority would look at this and say, what is this gray blob? <laughs> yeah, but look at all these these little, you see, yes, little crystals I, I at the top. I couldn't agree more with you. I couldn't agree more with you. You should probably also put out the uh, point out the stanite with zincanite from San Jose mine. I'm gonna Olympia. gesture at it because it looks like it's uh, the likely. We don't want to. It's very sort of thin, fine, needly crystals, but yes, certainly something to look at. And so it continues with South America classics and a few rarities mixed in between. I love the Boronite. The Boronite cogs wheels. The, the, these, re this find, and then the, the one that's end on right down there. Yeah. yeah. So you can really see that rotational twinning. Yeah. So typical of. Yeah. That's why I also obviously uh, named cogwheel ore when you, yeah. when you look at the old yeah. specimens. I always love historically how descriptive names were. It's like uh, like white lead ore for cerusite or green lead ore for pyromorphite. I think always that makes it so much more, oh yeah, now I understand yeah, it, yeah. sort of, you know? Well, and, and don't overlook that rhodochrosite, Lauren, from your <laughs> chalk up in the upper right corner. This single... Beautiful single red gemmy yeah. crystal. The one that looks like it missed the memo and originally came from Santo Lalia or South Africa. Well, the yeah. two Chakwa and Santo Lalia actually are, ge are geochemically very similar. Aura. But that color is far more um, South sort of Africa. you know, yeah. than, than you would actually think yeah. for two Chakwa, yeah. I mean, there it's more this, this blood red, sort of this uh, little hint of brown within the red, but this is really nice strawberry red. Diana had to rush off. She's uh, we're so busy with appointments, so she's rushed off to uh, to UK mining up at uh, Mineral City to meet some uh, some clients. So uh, we get to talk about Mexico, one of my favourite subjects. And I'm probably better off just standing here and listening to the Mexico master at work. Well, off you go, Peter. Favorite, but uh, a great selection here. You've got some classics. Oh, uh, I mean. That's a gorgeous Fleur Burger right down there on the bottom. I mean, the root beer tourmaline, most people aren't that familiar with it. Tourmaline collectors aren't that familiar with it, but it's a manganese rich tourmaline. Mexico is the type locality. Many people believe the locality is lost, which is only partially true. But that's, uh, that's a superb example of the species. And 
I think I saw you had another one somewhere, but that may have been in a different room. Oh, it's in the drawer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great classic. Uh, and then the other end of the spectrum is these icicle-like calcites that came out of Satiulalia. There were, I don't know how many thousands of specimens from the overall find that came out, but a very few of them have these completely transparent icicle-like tips. Um, you don't want to touch them. They are they are fragile, but uh, yeah. just almost like hoarfrost crystals, just spectacular just stuff. I love these last stage little calcites as they, you know, you get these big, long icicle styles, and then you get these little, little crystals that add glitter at the end, mm -hmm. especially this lower portion in here, and definitely some specimens I'm in love with. Yeah. Some of the classic amethysts coming out. This is the group, the style that came out last year. The sunbursts with the, the deep purple tips. Uh, and of course, a few San Francisco's, and a number of Los Lamentos pieces in there. Uh, just a great combination of classics and new things. Lauren, what's that thing down in the lower corner right up front? This guy? Yeah. This is a wolfenite with venetonite and dolomite from the Eruption mine in Los Lamentos. Uh -huh. A different take on a well-loved classic. Yes, it is. And of course, a smattering of bullyites and comengites. And a vulberthite that's very cute. And then, of course, there's this uh, Esmeralda mine hemimorphi, one of those big blue ones. It's actually the Bocona mine, but it oh. is from... It is from Durango, though. It is from Durango. It's actually from um, Guadalupe, Victoria, not much Australia. And that's the benefit of having you go through a case. Mexican minerals. <laughs> Preferably before they write the labels rather than... <laughs> yeah, thanks, Peter. More work for us to do. <laughs> well, maybe you'll sell the rock first. And this, uh, this is a case of U.S. and Canadian classics. Uh, the big amount from the uh, Mikhail Gunter collection. Um, lovely suite of Mont saint which is uh, almost impossible to put together these days. He obviously had a passion for it. And, but the hessianites the isolated hessianites on the matrix yeah right there those are really from jeffrey mine Although, yeah the jeffrey the, i love them when they're isolated like that and you don't see that very often they're much more often the complete crystal against crystal groups a, a, a lifeite leafite which is uh, from mont saint Lair again a little crystal ball up there that's uh, that's a good rarity and with these collars almost of the, the, the pink material. The oh, okay. Yeah. Sarandite with luster. Carltonite's pretty attractive too, with the brilliant blue color right there. Yep, that's very nice. Um, this I'm proud of, a nice uh, catapleurite. This is, uh, again, very rare to get to, to get a good one. Nice, nice sweet from uh, yeah. yeah. there. We don't, uh, we don't often have good uh, good things from there, but um, at the moment we do. This, this I love. Very, very, very pretty. Crystallized native copper from the Calumet and uh, Hecla mine in, in uh, Michigan. Yeah. And great history with this thing. So it originally was in the um, the Seaman Mineral Museum, mm -hmm. and they obviously exchanged it out. And it's great, great history. It was found in August 1939. How about that? Wow. Obtained yeah. in 1999. From, uh, this is from an old collection, and uh, yeah, lovely patina on it. Just like a little copper flower. So that's a beautiful specimen. Mm -hmm. It's really cute. And it's something I haven't had for years. Zexterite, look at that. Something you just never see a good one of, and I'm really happy to have that. From Okanagan County, Washington State. 
And it's cute too. It is. It's, you could go collecting there. And only a few hours from the house. But I don't think I can find something like this anytime soon. Don't be such a pessimist. You got to get out and do some digging. And you know, that's somebody went out and did digging and found that. So you could too. We're expecting next year big ones, Lauren. Yeah. Okay, I will, yeah. I will work on that. The challenge is on. Wonderful sweet from the European Alps and uh, a few classics thrown in there. So we have everything from very long nice side labels in this very early uh, Bord de Son uh, quartz group, um, lovely Gwindles. That's a, the axonite at the top is a, it's an Alpine vax, uh, axonite from, uh, yeah. from Switzerland. Great classic. Number of nice Eisen roses. Yeah, nice oh, yeah. smattering. You know, we've got some Swiss Thank ones, there's Austrian ones. That's very cute. Yeah, that's that, a, that's a that, lovely that one. That Wendell, freestanding Wendell, the tapers to the end is pretty cute too. And I have to say, my, my eye ends up getting drawn down to this really aesthetic sulfur crystal sitting here from Italy. Yeah, it's a nice little suite of Italian minerals there. Um, great Smith's Nights from, uh, yeah. from Sardinia. Um, very, 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 very bright hemimorphite from Sardinia as well. Uh, one of the nicest colors of hemimorphite. Another great rarity is Nolmanite from uh, Mount Narva mine, Sardinia. Great rarity, very well crystallized, nice and sharp. Beautiful, beautiful specimen. If you like almondite. What's not to like about almond? And this is something for the feldspar collectors. That classic, classic, classic. Again, something you just very rarely see for see uh, see for sale. It's a very nice. Um, uh, Group of orthoclase orphan crystals from Bovino in Italy. Very cool. That's so ugly, but it's quite an important specimen. Where's it from? From Greenland. It's from a Greenland. wonderful, wonderful crystallized cryolite from Greenland. It's uh, one of the real rarities of the mineral world is, is crystallized cryolite. And the best ones came from Greenland. The deposits now exhausted and uh, very rare mineralogy. What is cryolite? Sodium aluminum fluoride. Uh, sodium, it's okay. So I messed up the sodium, but uh, yeah, incredibly oh. rich thing. This is a cool piece. This little Boronite tower from Prebrum. So again, it shows the strength of the, uh, the strength of the Gunter collection. Yeah. Great classics, well crystallized, very well chosen. It's, it's a pleasure to, uh, it's a pleasure to have customers that really know what they're buying, and and uh, you know over over some decades, if you buy right, you can accumulate a collection that is just just phenomenal. It's uh, it's a pleasure to handle minerals like this. And this is a, another selection of uh, great European classics, um, pyromorphites and mimetites from. And wolfenites from different parts of uh, different parts of Europe here. This is a, a nice rarity from uh, El Holcajo in in Spain. Lovely old, lovely old labels. Very rare to get a good one. Chartreuse esque color. That's not a bird. Um, how about from Sardinia? Something you don't see too often. A nice more oh. fight from Sardinia. It's actually surprising you don't see more from there. 
Yeah, yeah. I think those mines were quite early, and the oxide yeah. zone was mined away at an early date, I guess. Typical of many European locations. Oh, Everyone's cool. favourite, blau blyats. Blue lead ore. Yeah. And uh, these... Uh, these are this is probably the world's best location for uh, Galena's pseudomorphic pyromorphite. I think it, it may be hard to say best because I'm not sure how many other localities there are that do that. There are quite a few. Really? It's, uh, Wheel got in France. Uh, there's, uh, okay. And the type of location was Jopau in Saxony, yeah. um, where they first found them. Um, they're not very inspiring there, but in Cornwall you get the, the great ones from Wheel Hope. Mm, um, which okay. is very pretty, but still the the crown for Blaubrei arts belongs yeah. with the uh, with the uh, Germans. It's uh, it's only a matter of time before they find them this big in China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Little halite with look at that halite crystals oh overgrown with little gypsum twins. That's uh, that's beautiful. I love the almost like spiky hat sitting on top there. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful thing. Many, many European silver minerals, Germany, Czech Republic. Um, what a what a great selection. A few South American ones in there, but what a what a great selection there. And something that uh, something I've not seen for sale for a long time is a, a very very good native antinomy from uh, from Germany, from the Hartz Mountains. Looks like it's from an old collection. I see a date of. 1889 on there? Yeah, I think it's an old rump label and it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, it this is. is. This is great. Great, great, great. And it's very aesthetic as well. For a very nice crystallized native bismuth from, uh, from Schliemer in Germany. It's got a root forms. Nice, nice natural patina. Very, very nice thing. The size of that acanthite that's covered with pyrite from Norway. I was going to say, I was going to let you have that one. Now there's a rock. That's gorgeous. Is it replaced or is it a coating? I, I think I probably have to go with yes. I think it's a bit of both. Yeah. Really sharp termination. Really well developed prism. I've never heard of these. Where are they? For, where is it from in Norway? It's from the Kongsberg ore field. From Kongsberg. Yeah, one, okay. one of the mines there. Wow. And this is something I've, I've not had before. It's a, a, a good specimen from the Saint Marie All Means um, ore field in in France. Um, we all we all know it for the mineral shows there, but uh, as you can guess from the my, uh, from the name, yeah. um, the remains there and the, the mines are ancient. There are uh, very few specimens survived, and this is a very nice native silver with uh, sapphire from the mines of Saint Marie. It's um, almost impossible to get something good from there, and this is just lovely to have. Of course English minerals, Crystal Classics will always have nice English minerals I hope and uh, they get harder to get and when uh, we pick up a nice old collection like this it's a pleasure to have so many really nice British Classics, a lot from Cornwall, um, a lot from the north of England. Um, this little section here is something I'm very proud of, it's uh, a smattering of uh, many, yeah. many copper arsenates that came from the um, Real Unity and Real Gordon mines in Cornwall. Most of them date from the mid 1700s to early 1800s, very, very early when they went through the oxide ores there. It produced uh, great laurocanites, uh, um, with strachomerite, uh, clinoclase, um, olivonite, and this is something you really don't see very often is a, is a great conolite. We know them from uh, from Bisbee, of course, uh, but some of the very best came out very early on in the upper parts of the ore bodies of uh, Will Gorland and uh, 
Well, Unity. In in thirty years, I've only had three or four nice ones, and th this one's very rich. Great the color. color it's just is a insane. spectacular little match suite of the most famous minerals from from that movie. Yeah, they're matched in size. They're matched in quality. Probably matched in age, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. That is a cool piece. That's a cool piece. And, uh, you know, over the years, as, as time ticks by, you see old friends come back, and I was delighted to get this specimen back. Um, it's even got one of our very early old Crystal Classics labels, which is, uh, that's, that's one of my old handwritten labels dating back to, gosh, back to the 19, 1990s, I guess. Look at that. That's an old Crystal Classics handwritten label when, when I was based in Devon. Um, wow. You know, nice, nice Sir Arthur Russell label, so it was obviously originally in the, the Russell collection. Yeah. And uh, it's just nice to see old friends come back, and it's, it's great to have. It's great to have something like that come back. It's one of the fun parts about keeping the labels is that you get to see the, the history on the specimen. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great kind of clays. Um, originally, originally called beetle ore by the miners because back in the, if you think about it, back in the mid 17, late 1700s, there were no proper mineral names. So the miners had names for all these things based upon what they looked like. And uh, clinoclase, when they're bigger crystals, they look like scarab beetles. So they called it beetle ore. <laughs> and um, you, you can imagine that the thousands of tons of beetle ore that got sent to the smelter to make copper. And uh, this is, uh, again, back to, uh, back to the real reason for these things back being mined. It's, um, yeah. Now that was, that was beetle survivors. ore. That was beetle ore. Um, the Rockenite was uh, was termed eight-sided copper ore. Eight-sided copper yeah. ore. So if you look at a crystal of the Rockenite, it has eight faces. Yep. Yeah. So uh, they called it eight-sided copper ore. That was that's what it was. And they must have seen large enough crystals that that was the easy identifier yeah. for it. It's yeah. not Imagine the little that. tiny guys. Imagine that. Of course, everyone knows the one in Truro Museum. The one in Truro Museum is the best. Yeah. yeah. And this was. Uh, Back to the clinoclase, this was blue velvet ore. So they obviously had enough of that where they thought it was ore. So blue velvet ore. Send it, send it to the smelter, guys. Oh. And uh, great, uh, great, great history. On the top shelf, you've got a nice uh, lady slipper there. Yeah, this is a nice lady slipper. Um, Siderite from Virtuous Lady Mine in Devon. Um, dating, from the, uh, dating from the late 1880s. Um, Virtuous Lady Mine was a was a quite a rich copper mine, um, fairly small, and it's right on the banks of the River Tamar. And uh, when they when they were mining the ore body, they they found a lot of a lot of cavities. It's a metasomatic type uh, ore deposit, huh. and um, it produced these oddities. And uh, if you look at the sh the shape of that uh, specimen, it looks like a Victorian lady slipper, hence the name ladies uh, lady slipper. Um, yeah. and they, when the mine closed, they actually worked the mine for three or four years just for specimens. Of the lady slippers. So, uh, lady slippers, the capped quartzes and the, uh, the miner's boxes that came from there, the siderite after fluorite. So an early example of mineral specimens being mined for specimens. Right. So it's uh, perhaps one of the, that was perhaps one of the first mineral specimen mines. Which well, is, that's uh, a great link because it, it ties back to your background and Cornwall, Devon area, and early collecting, commercial collecting, yeah, and then to what you're doing now in, in northern England in the in the Weardale area. Yeah. So it's you know, the circles are closing on themselves again. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, History is a spiral, not a line. As it were. <laughs> That's right. A vortex. <laughs> Well, moving away a little bit from minerals, as we had our fluorites from Diana Maria mine earlier. So here's obviously something to, I, I themed it to guilty jewelry. You have all those mineral collectors, they're buying one specimen after another, and their wives at home say, darling, you haven't brought me anything. Now it's taken care of. 
Or you could do one step further and get matching earrings and necklace to match your favorite mineral specimen. And it happened yesterday. I had really? a woman collector and she was really happy to choose a necklace. And then from the sidelines, her husband pipes up, oh, but darling, you should get the matching mineral now to your, to your jewelry set. And she was most pleased about this suggestion, so she got her two at once. <laughs> so, but yes, as you can see, so it's been a long process, uh, a few years in the making before I finally tracked down someone capable of showcasing the beauty of this very soft stone of fluoride in jewelry. So it is limited to earrings and necklaces just because of the nature of the stone being yeah. too soft in rings or bracelets. And the newest sort of creations were those cabochons. Yeah, I was going to say, I love how they've got that iridescence and they really uh, stand out. So we hit that with the UV laser. Yeah. So they still retain their daylight fluorescence. Yeah. The more, yeah. the, the bigger the stone, the deeper the stone, obviously, the more of that will showcase in daylight. Um, so you can see it really with the bigger cut stones that, yeah. that they showcase that very well, that, daylight, that they retain that daylight fluorescence. And it's just a nice add-on to the whole brand of the Diana Maria mine to, to also do something with essentially non-collectors-worthy specimens. Oh. Sourcing those and, and bringing those out. The volume is very limited, um, but we have managed to put together a nice array of different cuts and different settings to showcase that and round off the program. And it all looks very affordable, so it's the kind of thing that uh, you, you, can, you can buy a nice set of jewelry and still go out and buy a flat or two of minerals here and there in the building. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you can really do the full Monty jewelry and mineral specimen without breaking the bank. Well, thank you so much for showing us everything today, Diana, and it's just what a gallery and what a place you guys have put together here and it's going to be exciting to see what happens here over the next couple of years. Well, we are certainly very excited to finally have a permanent home here in Tucson, being able to showcase the majority, if not all, of our minerals uh, on display year-round and it's been a pleasure to have you, as always, showing you around and I'm sure we could spend many hours more going through each and every case and, and talking about every single specimen we have on display. But that will just be well, totally outrageous. It would, yeah, but, but you know, it does still provide people a chance to come and look at the drawers and go through all the specimens. And it's a great reason to come and visit and sink a whole bunch of time in the drawers and, uh, and see these cases for themselves as well. I think, yes, if you haven't seen it, you can't judge. And you really should make an effort to come and visit us down here at the Tucson Fine Mineral Gallery. guys to the Collector's Edge Minerals in Golden, Colorado. Thanks very much, Steve. Yeah. Great to see you. Thanks Pleasure to see us. you both. Good but to see you, here. Christopher. It's always nice fun. To yeah. Fun to see the What's Hot in Tucson crew. Yep. You know, yeah, I, it's I, even more fun to see what you've got that's hot. <laughs> yes. And on top of that, I've got to say, I, I know this is a new location to you guys, and you walk into this room, and it's just pow. Like, it really Thank lights you. up. and. Thanks. I'm really excited to see what you guys Thank have. you so much. Well, we, we have the luxury this year of a few days to set up. And so instead of a few hours, we were able to do a little bit more planning than we might normally do. And so we were able to put together a case of some pretty spectacular tourmalines here, uh, including a beautiful uh, Malkan tourmaline from Russia. We call it the Trident. A uh, bicolored star out of uh, the Paidenera mine in, in uh, Brazil, and all sorts of other Paidenera tourmalines, beautiful piece uh, here and here, and other locations from around the world, some Afghani uh, specimens as well, and just a exciting tourmaline specimens, kind of eye candy for those who are coming to yeah. the Tucson Fine Mineral Gallery for the first time. It and I have to say, Collector's Edge always does such a great idea, great job with eye candy because you guys have the rotocross. I mean, how can you not just love that? Your eyes light up, you walk into the room and oh, Thank boom. you so, so much. And we're digging up there. 
So uh, as we head that way to look at some roto, there's also a case of some pretty incredible burl specimens as well. Yeah. Uh, Medina burls on the far end, aquamarines from Medina in Brazil, incredible uh, cosquesmine uh, emerald on calcite here, and a few heliodores from the Ukraine. And the most insanely pink morganite. Isn't that something? Just you yeah. see it from across the room. That's out of the um, Keith and Mona Proctor collection, and we're handling that for them. And, and uh, just an incredible, deeply saturated morganite. But uh, Collector's Edge, as you know, is, is famous for mining rhodochrosite in Colorado. Yeah. And uh, started out mining at the Sweet Home Mine, 1991 through 2004. And then Brian uh, felt like there was still a little bit of roto left in the ground there. And so in 2016, we started mining at the Detroit City Portal, a brand new mm -hmm. mining portal. And uh, we have been fortunate enough over the last few years to pull out some really spectacular cherry red rhodochrosite from the Detroit City Portal. And uh, so this is a mixture of both old and new, uh, new specimens. And uh, this past year, 2021, we were not that fortunate to mm -hmm. find a lot of open fractures filled with roto crystals. Uh, it was a little bit of a quiet mining year. All of the vein structures had roto in place within the vein, but it was filled solid. The, uh, the veins just didn't open up into pockets. So uh, in any case, we'll be mining ahead again in the spring of this year, and hopefully we'll get some nice pocket development so we can get some great roto crystals <laughs> once again. But uh, just always fun at the collector's edge to see some cherry red roto out of the sweet home. So, mine. so Steve, before you move on, yeah, uh, is there a distinct difference between sort of the classic sweet home and what's come out of the De Detroit? I mean, can you point to a specimen and say, yes, this this is Detroit, and you can tell because the color is deeper or the luster is Honestly, uh, I would say that it's almost impossible possible to tell if you're really well connected to what comes out pocket by pocket you can occasionally spot something that you said this never occurred at the sweet home and one of those was the the crystals of roto growing on really dense uh sphalerite tetrahedrite and chalcopyrite and out of uh, Dino's pocket which was one of our best mm -hmm. pockets in in 2019 mm -hmm. Uh, all of the rotos formed on a very thick rind of, of uh, sphalerite primarily, but some chalcopyrite and some tetrahedrite. Mm -hmm. And the, co the consequence of that was being a sulfide mineral and being in the ground for many millions of years, the sulfides were not always that competent. And so you will see a lot of these bright cherry red crystal groups or crystals that are on a little bit of black matrix, but they're not a nice big cluster that you were used to seeing uh, out of uh, the Sweet Home Mine. Well, the Detroit City out of Dino's Pocket in particular, this is one of the few not larger matrix pieces that had a ROM sitting on it, because a lot of the sulfide started to, to come apart, mm -hmm. and so uh, you only got the isolated crystals. But uh, other than that, I mean, the cherry red color and the luster of that is just as good as what we saw out of the original Sweet Home. Mm -hmm. We're about 200 feet higher. That's yep. about the only difference. And even within Sweet Home, every pocket was a little bit different. Uh -huh. Sometimes there was some fluorite, sometimes some hubnerite. Some... And so the pocket to pocket, it was amazing how diverse the pockets were. You'd occasionally get calcite spolanohedrons, and you go, huh, I didn't know we'd get that. But... And we were seeing the same thing here at the Detroit City Portal. We went into one pocket that had just beautiful scalenohedral calcite crystals. So uh, you just never quite know what you're going to find till you break into the pocket. 
Keep, is, keep digging and keep bringing us surprises. Yeah, one of the new things at the collector's edge is my replacement. And this is Christopher Clark. And uh, he is joining our company from uh, Jewelry Television. He spent 15 years there. He's a certified gemologist. And he's joining the collector's edge. I'm going to be retiring in April. And Christopher is going to be uh, the one taking my part of the country as a sales representative, mm -hmm. so wanted to introduce him and in, in his masked face on uh, camera. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, Big shoes to fill, Chris. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I got these. He's still going to be hard. It's still going to be hard. <laughs> uh, we're fortunate enough to being able to continue to mine at, at the Elk Creek uh, deposits in Meade County, South Dakota. And uh, this is the production from the late summer of 2021. And uh, every year they, they get a handful of concretions in the mining that turn out to have the potential to yield specimens. Many times those concretions at Elk Creek have a fossil in them. Uh, and they don't have barite or calcite in it, at least not crystallized. And uh, other times they're completely full uh, of minerals, so they don't have a vug where these uh, barite and calcite crystals can occur. But uh, we harvest what we can there, we bring it back to our lab, and they spend a couple months trimming and cleaning and preparing the specimens. And we had a really nice uh, year this year with some, some very attractive specimens, good kind of beer bottle color, amber mm -hmm. colored, bright, gemmy crystals. And so uh, nearly every one of these came out of this year's mining. So typically how big are the concretions? The concretions, I would say three feet to four feet across when they're, when they're coming out. And uh, then they'll take a diamond chainsaw and cut in to see if there's any uh, openings in it. And usually the vuggy areas within the concretion are real tortured. They're moving all sorts of different ways. And uh, you have to really trim it carefully to be able to yield uh, a specimen out of it because they don't just form in a, in a geode-like environment. There's a, a pathway that has some calcite on the interior as well as a few isolated barite crystals. So it's a lot of a lot of preparation work to come out with specimens as classic and attractive as this. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the one that's over here at the bottom shows you a little bit of the size. Uh, this is a really exceptionally rare piece to have an opening that would yield a specimen of that size. But the bright yellow is the calcite, and the, the amber beer bottle color is the barite crystals. And those are, gosh, the biggest one's probably five inches plus. Mm -hmm. yeah. So impressive for the locality. One of the other things I wanted to show you today, just think it's really kind of exciting stuff, is we were offered a, a large part of the contents of a big vug of aragonite uh, and some of it with azurite uh, associated with it. And so you have this nice uh, blue-green colored aragonite and some azurite uh, crystallization. And there was a fair amount of diversity in the color of these pieces. Uh, sometimes they were more of a Kelly mine blue and other times they got to a more sky blue, almost electric blue color. Uh, really impressive hummocky surfaces. And especially with the fact that like as you get deeper you've got more of the sparkle and as you come uh -huh. up it kind of smooths out and really gives it this kind of a celestial aspect to yeah, it. Yeah, it's really, they're just beautiful little specimens and we've we, they've been very popular. Well, it's really hard not to love a blue like that. I know, isn't it? Yeah, so we've been just thrilled to be able to have those. And our lab, of course, is, has been busy trimming and preparing those. The top shelf has some that we've been seeing in the marketplace, some of the wonderful Elbi crystals that came out of the Congo. Mm -hmm. And so just really gemmy crystals and nice bicolor. Fantastic. And another thing that we have uh, 
been really excited about is a new project in uh, the Suwezi district in northwestern province in Zambia, and just a uh, beautiful imperial topaz, uh, similar crystal morphology to what you see at the Oro Prado deposit, uh, and a color that's very reminiscent as well, especially in some of the darker, gemmier crystals. They have a very nice uh, imperial topaz color. I love how, you know, especially something like this almost has like a, a sherry aspect to it. It's uh -huh. got almost a pink undertone versus a yes, red undertone. Them, you're exactly right. We didn't get all that many of them that had that stronger pink, but we do have some that are, that are very noticeably pink in color. Yeah. So it's kind of cool that, uh, and we're, this is our second uh, major batch of these crystals and it's going to be ongoing. We've seen some with, with uh, cross sections uh -huh. uh, of, gosh, I'd say almost three centimeters across. So, so we expect to find somewhat larger and longer crystals. A lot of this material is going to be cut. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I suspect some of the gemmier, bigger crystals may not be coming to the US as crystal specimens oh. right now. But, Don't hurt uh, me like that. <laughs> But uh, they're really kind of an exciting new project, and we're we're uh, getting a number of the pieces. Uh, they've they've been very popular in the marketplace. No, I, I, there's there's an aspect of it reminds you of almost a, uh, a Tucson sunset with that pink to yeah, gold transition. That's a good good point. I like them a lot. They're a fun color. Granted, I'm definitely partial to imperial topaz, <laughs> so we better get away from that before I fall in love with something. I wanted to make a quick mention that we also have had what we're calling the fifth pocket of wolfenite and mimetite from uh, the La Merida mine. And these are distinctly lighter yellow mimetite and brighter yellow uh, wolfenite crystals. And you'll see a handful of those sprinkled in amongst ones that occurred in pockets one through, uh, through five. So, uh, Right now, nobody's digging for them, as far as I know, and our partners in that project have not been doing anything since they pulled out the most recent specimens here. But uh, they have really uh, great luster on the wolfenite, good transparency, and a nice, vibrant color. Yeah, that yellow is almost rep reminiscent of the, the yellows from Santo Eulalia. Very close. Uh -huh. Very close. That piece on the upper yeah, that, that's... Uh -huh. It and really, then that, and then that yellow is getting pale enough on the mimetite that some of these things have been analyzed and they turn out to be phosphohedophanes. Is so that you're, right? So you're actually kicked into another whole species. Isn't that interesting? Well, that's a great point. Yeah, so we've been excited to be on this project for a couple of years now and, and just been sp some spectacular production of wolfenite from a barite mine of all things. You don't really expect uh, this kind of blessing of beautiful crystals from a from a commercial barite mine. So well, remember it started out as a silver mine. Yeah. And then it became a barite mine. And then it became a wolfenite mine. <laughs> there you go. So what's next? <laughs> what's next? Fossil head of things. The world's best. And one of the other things I wanted to highlight is brand new for us. Uh, these are Paraiba tourmalines from the Brazil Paraiba mine. And uh, there is three different locations. I'll open this up a little bit more so you can get a good shot. There's three different locations in Brazil for copper-bearing elvite and paraiba tourmaline. And uh, this is one of the three. It's the largest of the three locations, and they call it the Brazil Paraiba Mine. And it's the uh, Molungu site in Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil. And we've been very fortunate to work directly with the mine owners and, and uh, their representatives, both on, on marketing the specimens, but also helping to prepare the specimens. They do some initial preparation in Brazil, and then we finish them up here in the, in the States. 
This, this material was found nearly two decades ago, and they didn't do anything with it. They just held it off to the side. These crystals were more or less like the emeralds we were marketing out of Kajam mine in Zambia, in that they were completely surrounded by quartz. And then the, we had to very delicately remove the quartz from around the uh, uh, cuprian-enriched uh, tourmalines. And uh, so they make beautiful specimens with almost a turquoise blue tourmaline yeah. color. And we really love these things. And some of the cool things is lipidolite is replacing uh, in some of these specimens or growing around on this one over here. Lipidolite is... Uh, in many cases replacing or growing around the, the elbites, the copper bearing elbites. Yeah, that, that second to the left one there, that transition line in the pseudomorph is just... Isn't that cool? It really makes it pop. Yeah, and this little guy here, they're in a whole lot of associations, but it also has some spodumene. So this is a spodumene mass here, and then the copper bearing elbite crystals here. Just really interesting. You don't see these uh, to this size uh, for this uh, copper bearing elbite species. So, kind of fun. It's hard not to love that color. Isn't that something? I'm going to brag about one more piece. I was going to say, it's hard this. not to love the color to the left, too. <laughs> Uh, that's about as nice a crystallization as you can find in a gold specimen, other than maybe the gold dragon at the Houston Museum. This came out of the same mine. It's the Colorado Quartz Mine, really well crystallized uh, gold. This came out of a collection that was in Florida that we just bought uh, the entire collection, and this was one of its uh, super pieces that were in the collection. And wow. I just love this piece. If I had the wherewithal, this would be mine. <laughs> well, especially because that piece, it's almost practically free floating in that matrix. Yeah, a just... little quartz crystal down there mm -hmm. in the bug, and it's just just as cool as it can be. Well, you, could, you could postpone your retirement. I could, and but take I a won't. Specimen. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a special piece, and some other beautiful golds, both from the GPRE Rare Earth Collection and the Proctor Collection as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have one more surprise to show you. Should we Ooh. show them some I other really yeah, incredible so pieces? like surprises, <laughs> especially when they're in the back room. <laughs> It's nice to have this much real estate. Yeah. Uh, and not have to be doing this in a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is kind of fun. Oh, so, wow. when we talk about the potential for the specimens out of this location, this is another one of the copper bearing elbaite. A little bit of mica there, a little epitolite with it as well but uh, shows you the, the impressive color and size of these crystals. And again, things like this have just really never been seen. There were some, some earlier uh, specimens that came out of very gemmy material from one of the other Brazilian locations. But pieces like the these... Yep. Isn't that cool? You with the big, yeah. the big flake of a uh, yeah. spodumene on yeah. the back for writing yeah. that that contrasting pale pink to the electric blue. Isn't that something? And how gemmy it is on I this know. one. Wow. Yeah. And then another one of these that's just as fun as it can be. Oh just, my gosh. Yeah, really long Paraiba tourmaline crystals. And these are entirely worked out of the quartz. Yes, in entirely way. worked out. Yeah, they were completely... How long does it take them to work something like that? You know, I can tell you that on the emeralds uh, that we did out of the Kaja mine, they would take months to do it. It's done both with micro pneumatic tools and with air abrasives and with uh, taking lots of care to stabilize in between each step. So it would take months to prepare specimens mm -hmm. like this. Wow. And I got one more in addition to that one. This one's got some of the most oh. electric color. I just... think I just fell in love. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, you're just not used to seeing tourmaline in that kind of color. You do see blues and you see lots of greens and reds, but this almost turquoise color is just uh, unique for... I think part of it is you're not used to seeing the turquoise color with this much transparency. Yes. Right? Yes. Even even though they're not like truly transparent, like you get a crystal like this over on the side where you get that yeah. transparent aspect and your brain goes, I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to say is coming from the gemological side for years and years with periva tourmaline being such uh, the pinnacle of uh, faceted tourmaline, when these came in, these guys were really excited. I was positively giddy. I mean, my stomach just fluttered as soon as I saw these because I never expected to see this kind of material, especially on a matrix like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So uh, we're just excited to be able to participate as a part of the Tucson Fine Mineral Gallery, and it's a treat to have you both here to uh, share some of these things with us. Oops. Well, if you could see my smile right now, <laughs> it's ear to ear. I really appreciate you showing us these specimens. I'm gonna hand that to you. Sure. And uh, really excited for what this gallery is gonna do and yeah. what it becomes. And uh, thank you for sharing today. Well, thanks for being with us. We appreciate you coming. How are you doing Hi. today? Nice to see you both great again. You. Patrick, great to see you. Great to see Tucson, you. Bob. Finally, we do it to Tucson. Yeah. Hope it's for all a good show. But Welcome to my new gallery room here in the fine uh -huh. Tucson Mineral Gallery. Very excited to be here. It's the first time. I hope you like this room. It's beautiful. Thank you. And of course, you have beautiful stuff as, as you do every year. And excited to see what you've got going on here in 2022. Yeah, thank and, and, you. And understand that, that you've actually got a mixture of you and some other people and some yes. other things here. My main problem is that I have not enough finished carvings to fill up this whole room. And on the other side, I really like to work with other artists together, very close together. It's very easy to, to work artists with artists. So this year I have uh, different artists. Um, one is uh, uh, Matthias Fickinger, he's also German carvers. Mm -hmm. um, he make more of this uh, funny styles. Mm -hmm. When you see this turtle, make war, not la uh, make war, <laughs> laugh, not war. <laughs> also as uh, the, the chimp. Polar bear. Polar bear, exactly. The, the, the chimp wearing the, the headphones, Hats that's one. fantastic. Exactly. Um, and yeah, the rhino kicking back is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice done. Yeah, really nice. Uh, we have here a company from my hometown, Ida Oberstein. It's a uh, grown rip. They are very, very famous for high-end uh, gemstones. Um, we work very close together because I grew up with a daughter, Nicole Rip. Ah. She's an expert for, for gemstones. And she would always, for many years, like to come to Tucson. But in the same time, we have the Inhogenda show. That is the main show in Europe for faceted jewelry things. Uh -huh. So she got no do it. And uh, mm -hmm. I got a new assistant. She is gem logist. So everything come together and we decided um, to show the, the, the stones from Nicole this year, first time in Tucson. It's already planned that she come next year with a bigger booth yeah. There's more stuff. Wow, the, the color in here is just gobsmacking, honestly. Yeah, look at the small, tiny Paraiba. Very famous. Uh, they have the Santa Maria Aquamarines, which are really stuff from the grandfather of her. Oh, wow. And then this stone in the center there? Yeah, it's a tourmaline. Very unique in color. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's my favorite color, so my eyes automatically so drawn we, to it. We try to show a little bit the variety what they have, not the, too much from one stone. So we show the, the peridots, the aquas, morganites, uh, garnets, tourmalines, emerald, and the paripa tourmalines. Yeah. And the pink stone is a tourmaline or a spinel? It's a tour this is a morganite. Right. No, in the, the, in the, the hot pink. 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 So this is a tourmaline. That's a tourmaline. Yeah. Wow. It's excellent color. Yeah. My favorite is really the blue one, the blue yeah. the center. It just draws your eye. This is, it comes not really out because the light is not perfect for gemstones. 
Uh, it's a really a neon greenish paripa, very unusual color. Oh. I haven't seen that color before necessarily in a paribas. They look exactly. really good. They would, under full spectrum light that doesn't yeah. have the cyan missing for most LEDs, that would really pop. I mean, for next gorgeous. year, for next year we will be better prepared. Uh -huh. well, yeah. They're still a knockout as they sit now. Then we have on the upper side, or other side, we have here pieces for Nikolai Medyev. I think. Everybody know in Tucson. He builds yeah. these amazing boxes. He has his big showcases. Mm -hmm. We have only Naomi. She's an artist from New York. With their showcases here, and this is how do they say this here our guest exhibitors. Got it. And we are happy that they are here. She wins a lot of prizes from HGTA. I can see why. Uh -huh. I think very we... modern style, but very artistic style. She used very nice gemstones. I think you can later speak direct to her. She can introduce. Mm -hmm. Nikolai is, sorry, not here. I don't know where he is gone. Mm -hmm. I think it was a meeting. But the work that he does is just always so intricate. The way that yeah. he matches things and layers them. And... and interesting is really that you don't see where the stones fit together. If you have not the high quality boxes, you always see clue between the two gemstones. And here you see really nothing. Mm -hmm. It fits perfect. Wow. Truly remarkable. Yeah, and here I have some carvings I did. Some are already sold. <laughs> I'm really happy about it. So um, I did this here five carvings. Okay. Because my time was really limited. You see this Titrine toad I did, the Morganite frog, a small rabbit, and the seahorse from um, um, Rubies. The sea turtle from Jasper is from my father, I tell you later about it. And the rooster I get from a client, he wants to sell it again. Got it. So if you have any question, please ask. Yeah. Gorgeous things. How do you, you know, you're looking at a crystal, right? And like, for instance, this frog back here, you have it so perfectly oriented that the frog is in the, the pink and as it transitions to that green, I mean, when you're looking at a, the raw material, you know, do you see the frog in your mind's eye or is it something that comes out as you go along? Um, so most important is when you get a rough stone to read the stone, you need to have this vision, what is in the stone, and you get an idea which animal you can uh, carve out of. But for sure, um, mostly the first idea is not the last idea. So during working, you need to always be flexible to follow the stone, to follow the color of the stone. Thank you. My, I always have the big respect for my father. He was my teacher, he was my master and my father. Yeah, and, um, I know that's like. <laughs> I worked side by side for more than 30 years together. And I'm very pleased he teach me a lot. So he teach me much more as a normal apprentice he gets. Um, it was also sometimes a really hard learning because he wants that my level of skill goes really quick up. But at the end I say I'm very pleased about my father. Um, and I, how to say, following his footsteps. Mm -hmm but also try to continue yeah. to going on. That was heated with my grandfather, and I forwarded the, the idea to the new time. So. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So can we see the, the other pieces? So then before you do, what? is there anything in that case I mean, that, that really grabs you, that goes? Well, I can say that Honestly, if the little amethyst bunny wasn't already sold, I know my mother would have fallen in love with it already. But she hasn't been down here. I know. So how would she know? And, no, but that's Patrick, what I'm saying. you were saying over lunch that, that you could have sold that bunny. Today, two times, yesterday, three times. Oh, but there was two days ago before the opening, there was a very nice guy in here, and he immediately said, I like it, I want it. Yeah. 
Oh, it just it it jumps right out and. But I cannot really remember his name. I'm, I'm I think it was Peter. Peter. What was the last name? Oops. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was sitting here looking at this thing, being like, my mom would love it. She would be obsessed with it, but it's sold already. Oh my gosh. Good. Wow, you're way too good. <laughs> that is fantastic. He immediately came in. That was his wife. He needed. Yep. We've been waiting days to be able to play this moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw it and I was just like, that, that, that has my mom written all over it, but someone was faster. I guess they weren't. No, they weren't. <laughs> So well, you got to get a good close of it. Oh, I got close ups of it. <laughs> <laughs> again at the end. That was it. Was the reaction shot that I wanted to have? We'll 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 have to uh, share share the video with mom, of so, course. After Valentine's Day. Of, uh, of course, of course, yes, yes. <laughs> so let's look at your dad's stuff. Okay, yeah. sure. Oh, that's that's awesome. So you see a nice collection of my dad's pieces. They are done between 1990 and uh, 2010. The bear is hilarious. It's cool. I huh? love him. Yeah, yeah. I also like this uh, tea green frog. It's also the lighting not perfect, but this amazing um, whiskey color tea green mm -hmm. on a funky. Uh, I love it. And and the, the the way that he's interacting, but he's got this. There's a sense of movement in him, and there's almost like a predatory aspect. <laughs> and is he a frog or a toad? A toad. A toad. Okay. My father really likes the toads because of this, I have to say the toads and the mice as the carvings which are mostly done in the age of my father, was in time. My father, uh, he always say, we can do some very well nice carved, and you can get some a little bit human expression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, same with the mouse. This mouse has really attracted a lot of visitors. Everyone comes in, wow, this mouse, this mouse. And when you see every feed is worked through, it's, oh, a, bi wow. it's a bicolor morganite. Today, to get this quality of stone is very hard and if very expensive. Yeah. No, the, the, the great pink and the, the bluish mint tone. There's yeah, he's so, something special. So how do you get that sort of pebbled texture to the toad skin and to the base that the um, each each one of those and you do it entirely by hand? Or? Yes, everything is done by hand. We have no machine and we have no stamp who do everything for like bump. That, but but is do you do a template? Do you just do it by eye? Is it by is, eye? Yeah, okay. by eye. To make one bump of the toad are five steps to get one finish. And what are those steps? Just out of um, first, you have a dental tools. You make it round. Mm -hmm. Then you give him with the second step the form to get it on top like a capuchon. Mm -hmm. Then you make it um, how to say you 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 finish them. Then it is a rough polishing, and at the end is a high polishing. Wow. Yeah. And that's again and again and again with every little. And picture. no, you make the first step through the toad toads and the second step. So. Okay. So, and uh, you are flexible. Um, if it would be one tool, which you make step by uh, bump by bump, they would have all the same sizes. Mm -hmm. But here, when you look in detail, each bump is different sized. Yeah. Oh wow. And with this technique, you can also follow. Um, the color, the stones, make a bigger bumps where the stone is very clean to light up the colors. Where it's not so nice, you make smaller bumps where maybe a small mistake is. You took it in, in the valley of a bump. Wow. It's the same with the, with the, with the hair or the, the fur of a, of a mouse. It's very tiny um, carving tools. They are maybe three millimeters in diameter and 0 0.3 millimeter thick. Wow. And then you carve the fur really hair by hair more or less. And you need also to give 
the, the fear, um, the movement the of movement, our origin. Yeah. So I'm sure the people watching are going to ask, how long does it take to make one of these? <laughs> oh, normally, uh, starting piece is around 80 hours, and it goes up to 300, 400 working hours in total. Wow. Now, it depends on the gemstone, it depends on the working time you need to invest. And because there's detail working, which we call it, it takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for sure, when you see the working through all the fingers, the risk is very high. And when yeah. you're working too fast, you yeah. destroy it and then it's gone. You yeah. cannot glue it again. Um, it's you know, finished. Yeah. Same as when you see the tail, it's worked through. That are those tiny details which make our carving special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, I was looking here at the, the orangutan and the way, you know, his fingers are so beautifully articulated and there's that sense of motion in them, but also that must have been terrifying to have to carve that, you know, you're, it's an undercut and they're so fine and, yeah, it's, it's being able to take the time with it. That's a huge aspect. Um, and special, if you come more closer to the finish, you make the fine detail work, like the fingers of an orangutan. So the risk get higher and higher. When you when you break a piece at the first 10 hours, you say, okay, it's sad. But if you destroy it after 100, 200 working hour, it's more yeah. difficult. Mm -hmm. And my father always say, we will never glue object, we will never repair objects, because we don't want to destroy our own name. So if anything broken, it's gone. It will not come to sale. Wow. So, speaking of something really special, oh, oh speaking I'm of something over there that just blows my mind. Thank you yeah, so I've much. Yeah, I've got to say, walked in and saw this, and just he is something special. I was very, very pleased when Ian Bruce offered me this room in this gallery, in his gallery, and I had the idea to produce every year one masterpiece for the gallery, anything special anything special in stone, anything special in design. Um, we had this crystal brace in stock. It was a bigger piece and it was split half and half. And one time, oh, many years ago, my father made a frog different design. And the people really loved this frog because the color of the crystal brace was amazing. And uh, it got sold later to Russia. Um, and I had this half chrysoprase left, and I think that would be amazing to do a similar piece, but a completely different position of the frog. Mm -hmm. So I started the project, and the reed is all 18 karat gold. Oh, wow. It's around 200 grams of gold. The base is a rock crystal. And interesting is to know that you you need to finish the frog when it is mounted to the gold. Oh, wow. It's not like that you finish the frog, put it on gold and finish, no. It's preformed and then you need to fix it in the gold and then you can carve all the fingers. So they really touch this gold. Mm -hmm. And that makes it really, really difficult. And this gives a lot of, how to say, corners, which is hard to reach with the tools. And also later to polish those corners, is, it's a lot of time. So how much time? It was around 300 working hours. <clears throat> but you see all these tiny details. And the way that his back leg sits against it there. I study a lot of frogs sitting yeah. on reeds and uh, makes the design after the stone which I had. So I try for sure not to lose as much, uh, to save as much as possible from the gemstone because chrysoprase in this thickness is very, very real. Yeah. Well, it looks like you started your tradition on the right foot. Thank you.
I love the way that it goes into the, the, the rock crystal and you can see the flow of the water yeah. around the reed and it just sort of guides this, your this, eye up. This, uh, how to say, to show this water movement, it shows also the, the visitors that I invested time to make these details. Mm -hmm. If it would be a flat crystal, it would be easy. Yeah. But to carve the movement of the water, it takes time, and but it shows that it works, mm -hmm. how to yeah. say, fine till the end. Well, that's why it's a masterpiece. Thank you. Oh. So you're working on a new book now, right? Exactly. First of all, we had a new exhibition in, in the Euston Museum. Mm -hmm. It started in April. It will be a very interesting exhibition because um, years ago I found a collection for my grandfather in London which we never know, which my family did not know that they exist. Oh, wow. And when I talked to the, uh, the, the Joel Bart from Houston Museum, he said, we need to make immediately an exhibition about this because this collection was never on display. And the museum had a own part of the collection, its own collection. And we had some uh, pieces of our private collection for my mom and from one other a client from England. So it will be... Uh, a range between 160 and 180 pieces from three generations. And will that be the largest gathering of Dreyer carvings yeah, yeah, in one yeah, place? Yeah. Wow. And, and how long does that exhibit go till? Uh, almost, I think, one year in, in advanced. Also, okay. so, one year. And uh, then they decide to make a new book. So we worked together with Gloria Stabler from Lithography. Um, she was not so pleased with our first book. <laughs> she said it's a coffee table book, it's a simple book. And uh, she wanted to really make it now more professional, more bigger, more collectible. So it will come also for the exhibition in April out of the market. Well, he's something special, but I'm really attached to the little bunny rabbit. Well, that's good. It's found the right home. Because ultimately, it will probably be yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, look at his little feetsies. You pooped in your head? Feet? <laughs> oh, <sorry>. Feetsies? <laughs> look at the little, <laughs> the little buttons. Wow. Yeah, that's a cute bunny. Thank you. He's really something. Was there fossils? I do not my idea. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good thing in the carvings. They keep for generations. Mm -hmm. So they keep many times in the family. Mm -hmm. And that is good. And they stay like this. It's not that they get ugly or anything like the minerals, you know? You can have them in the family for many generations. That makes this mineral, gemstone, and carving collecting so famous, so fashion, so nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to say it was a big pleasure as every yes. year to see you both. And I hope you enjoyed this room. Very much better. Definitely. You know Naomi, so we want to give it to her. But thank you so much for showing us the, the beauty and looking forward to both the book and hopefully the exhibit too. Yeah, hope to see you in, in Houston in April again. Yeah, thank yeah. you for playing along with the rabbit and <laughs> really well. <laughs> I hope it was work well. Hey, how are you? I'm very good. I'm very excited to be here. That's how good I am. I'd love to hear about your work, it seems like you've got a lot of influences from nature um, and maybe water movement. What, what inspires you? True. To... Um, I've always been very interested in how things are draped um, or erosion. I was born and raised in Butte, Montana, and uh, so minerals and mining always uh, was literally a part of my uh, early breathing even, yeah. and um, uh, uh, erosion uh, of the land is, is very intriguing to me. But also when you see drapery on, on Renaissance uh, uh, paintings, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. how did that happen? How did that artist do that so that it looks so textural and velvety and wonderful. So 
when I started carving, I wasn't really interested in saving the material. For me, the design was the most important part. And sometimes somebody will say to me, well, you're wasting precious material. And I would find that inhibiting, and then I would have to stop for a while until I could get over it and work directly on the design. So I think that's one of the things that makes my work different is that the design drives the carving, not the weight retention. Yeah. So that puts me into a somewhat different arena in terms of cutting and carving, that sort of thing. Because I want the piece to look the way that I want it, period. And um, so I, I like color a great deal. Yes. And I also am interested in sparkle. When you have a faceted stone, you're interested in how the light comes out of it. So diffract, diffraction and ref, reflection, those are very important things. What I'm interested in is distortion. I want the back and the front to work differently against each other so that you get lines and colors and shapes that really don't exist. They're an interaction of the back and the front. A lot of this is just an illusion. Wow. No, I think the, this back corner, the, the rutilated cork, does a beautiful job of displaying that because as it rotates, you exactly. really get a sense of from every direction. It's got a different feel, a different flow to true. it. True. That's true. And when you look at the back, you can see the inner carving that's coming through, but it isn't carved like that. It doesn't look like that on the inside. It looks different. The same with the topaz. Mm -hmm. The topaz on the back has a ripply look, and on the front, I have all these divots so that the ripples get distorted. Wow. No, you can really see here the, the holes and that indent you exactly. did to the center. Exactly. And, and the same with the Rose de France amethyst and with this topaz. I kept thinking to myself, well, what will happen if I go deeper? How can I change the shape of what you're seeing? So that sort of whirlpool effect doesn't really exist, except as an interaction of the front and the back. Well, for somebody like Lauren... I'm a whitewater kayaker, so I'm looking at that, and it actually represents, you know, when you're on really turbulent eddy lines... Yes. In, ...in really blue water on, like, black rock... Yes. ...you get these incredible distortions, because you'll see them way deep. But it's the only kind of thing that can exist if um, my blood sugar wasn't doing something weird and uh, disrupting this brief moment. <laughs> okay. It, it, it's the kind of thing that I... I the way that you're capturing that flow, I've never seen something carved that actually captured that same sort of Thank you. Thank ability. You very much. And that was, especially with that topaz there, I was looking at it and I'm going, that looks like I've one of these crazy before. waves. True. But the thing that's always weird is the way that the water, the light comes from not only like below and above and through in different ways. And it's just, I really like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is really one of my very favorite pieces. I, I can see why. <laughs> yes, I really enjoyed that. See how you could be fascinated by things like ventifacts, too, where the wind has True. carved things oh, I, I coming have, from different directions. I, and... I have several um, small jade pieces from uh, the Gobi Desert, and they have those beautiful mm -hmm. curves in them that, you know, ain't nature wonderful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, but for all my talk about carving, that aquamarine crystal is pristine. I love the steps of diamonds across the top. It really accentuates it. That is... Thank you. Um, it's platinum and diamonds, and I call that the New York City skyline mm -hmm. because that's where I live now. So you went from Butte, Montana to New York City. Truly. It's amazing. What a story. <laughs> So the, um, the topaz is a very unusual piece, the, the pink topaz. That's a 90-carat natural 
pink topaz. Wow. Very rare. And this is a very large, very clear Mexican fire opal. Oh, wow. And is it, there's not a backing to that. Yes. Oh, there's, there's a, a backing. There's a reflector on the back. And that's how it's getting that color. Exactly, okay. because the back of that opal has been carved. Well, that was, that was, I guess, my question is, is it carved on the back side? That's why you're getting that distortion coming through. It's carved on the front and on the back. And the same with the pink topaz. And the same with my aquamarine brooch. Yeah. Got it. So that you get this watery feeling with the intersection of lines. Yeah. Fantastic. And the light jumping all over the place. So you have another piece turning in place ah, over here? No, it's not a tourmaline. No, I said no, no, turning. Turning. I turning. Tourmaline, yes, like yes. Tanzanite. It is truly Tanzanite. And this has a very lovely story. It may be one of the largest top colored carved Tanzanites in the world. Mm -hmm. And when I carved it, I turned it upside down so that the crystal face is what fits into the base here, mm -hmm. which is silver. And this carving, the profits of this carving will go for eye care for the Maasai. Because the first time that I went to Tanzania, I noticed that all of these really wonderful people had no eyeglasses and they were suffering from various eye diseases. So um, the Tanzanite mine, this came from uh, Tanzanite 1. It's way out. It's not in a normal place. Mm -hmm. And you can't just run down and have your eyes checked and mm -hmm. pick up a pair of eyeglasses. So um, I made an agreement with the seller that this would be I, I, I received a very wonderful price for it, and that the uh, profits would go for eye care to these Maasai people who are so wonderful. And the nature of the base is the way the wind goes up the Rift Valley. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of encompassed my experience there. I love being at the mine. I thought it was truly marvelous to be there. The way that the color changes as this thing's rotating is really mesmerizing. Yes, yeah, you can see the the purple violet and then the blue. When it comes it around, you get the green and the blue. The the green aspects actually truly it's really interesting because it's on the edges almost as yes. it's rotating. Yeah. Because you don't have a flat face. It's not like it all goes in one. You get this sort of transition as it's going around. Well, I tried to be very respectful of the crystal. Um, it's exactly the same outside dimensions now as it was when I got it. And the carving kind of all went inside. Wow. I didn't make any attempt to remove any of the natural inclusions, the cells that had sulfuric acid in them actually, um, peeling uh, my skin off. It was quite an adventure to carve it. Wow. But um, I, this is nature. This is uh, as close to the nature of Tanzania and the Tanzanite mines as I could get. Well, we certainly hope that... Uh... I'm Sale sure that is it successful will. so that you, you get to put a lot of eyeglasses on people. I sincerely hope so. Thank That's you. It's wonderful. Thank, well, you. thank you, Naomi. It's been a real pleasure to thank you very walk much. through your stuff. Really I'm, like it. Yeah, very, very much. Very different and fun. Thank you. Thank you. This afternoon. Hi, Lauren. Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, hi, great Peter. to see you, Nikolai. Nice seeing you too. Used to seeing you down at the main show, but it's nice to see you here in your new uh, uh, digs operations <laughs> here with, uh, with, with Patrick. Patrick. Yeah. yeah, this is a, a quite a new adventure for all of us. You know, it's the first time we're doing this year mm -hmm. this exhibit, and I'm glad that 
that you invited me, you know, for the uh, for the exhibit. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got to say, your 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 pieces always capture the imagination because there's you've taken such time and you've been so careful to lay them out in such a way that each piece, each part of the 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 box talks to another part and it tells a whole story together and it's. They really are remarkable, and I always enjoy seeing people at the Tucson show, at the main show, remarking on them and mm -hmm. being able to spend a little bit of time here without having to throw any elbows to really get to see yeah, them. Yeah. Great. Yeah, this is kind of a, you know, uh, that's what I do, you know, uh, for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a big, you know, incredible experience for me to use a variety of different minerals in my work, you know, and, uh, you know, I learn a lot in the process and so, educate so myself. How do you go about making a box like that? I mean, where do you start? Well, uh, uh, most of the time, you know, uh, when I get uh, kind of a unique uh, a piece of rough, so I study it, you know, and uh, the one that would be cuttable, you know. Of course, I would never destroy perfect specimen, you know. I only use something that damaged or uh, just cuttable material. <clears throat> so typically it starts with the idea of the centerpiece, which is top of the box. And uh, so I choose that, so that dictates me on some level dimensions, size of the box, because I have to frame it with the other minerals. And that gives me some idea what the size, physical size of the object will be. And then, you know, I uh, start constructing the body. You know, so the body is being constructed out of uh, uh, different rocks that are ba as a base. And then, you know, I start uh, processing the material. So I'm cutting the uh, additional material, you know, to, to do the surface coverage. So, of course, I cut much more extra than I need for the project. And uh, then I have a choice to select... Like out of 100 pieces, I would pick the best one that fits just right for that particular project. Yeah. And uh, in, in the occasion, you know, i done some collaboration with the other artists, you know, usually jewelers like mm -hmm. Susan Helmich, you know, Paula Kravish here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, there are a few other people that uh, I was uh, doing some collaboration, so which is involved usually gold work. Yeah. That being, you know, uh, attached to the box on the exterior or on the interior. Yeah, this is great because, I mean, I've known you for, I don't know, 25 years as an exhibitor, uh, please, but this yeah. is the first time I've had the chance to really understand mm -hmm. on a very basic granular level how you do your work, and it's spectacular. Thank yeah. you well, so you much Well, you should come sharing. and visit me, uh, Peter, yeah, you know, in my studio. I mean, we're here in the same town, you know, yeah. and uh, I'll show you the my operation, whatever it is. That'd be really cool. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the rocks and everything, and of course the techniques, and I could share more, you know, mm -hmm. in details, cool. you know, that how actually process is happening. We'll make know. a date for some time in the spring. Absolutely, Before Anytime. it gets too hot in Tucson. Yes. <laughs> so we're here in Tucson right now, as you all know, and sometimes dealers who are normally here in Tucson are not able to come. And this is uh, the case with our next guest. This is Stuart Walensky with Walensky Exquisite Minerals. He is back in New York. He could not make it to Tucson because of the current COVID crisis. So we have organized a Zoom interview with him. So Peter, Lauren, go ahead, take it away. Well, hello, Stu. It's great to see you uh, at a distance. Um, Looks like quite an exhibition behind you. Uh, I take it this is part of what you have to tell us about and part of why you can't be here in Tucson? Yes, exactly. So here in the gallery, we do exhibitions quarterly. And this one that we have on display behind me is called Candy. And where we came up with the name was partly because minerals, a lot of minerals look like candy, but it was really a little bit more than that. It was as if you were a child and the first time you came in contact with candy and how the colors and the shapes were so appealing to you. And so we're relating that to mineral collectors when they see their first minerals. And so it's that whole concept of how exciting and colorful candy would be to a child. And as collectors, basically these minerals are our candy. And uh, as 
as viewers, we enjoy them for the first time as if we did as a child looking at candy. So let me take you through the through the gallery. We're going to do this, what we call the white room, and then um, we'll go move on and see the rest of the collection. But let's go over here first. Um, we'll start at the back wall here, where we have two minerals on display. In this case, on the right here, we've got a uh, very important Illinois fluorite which is sometimes referred to as the blue cap pocket. Um, I don't remember the year they came out, but there were there were not that many of them. And this is considered one of the finest known examples from that blue cap pocket. And then on the other side to the left of the fluorite, we have this wonderful Ethiopian opal that has colors that look really very much like candy. And you guys just jump in if you have any questions, please. I'm happy to answer them about any of the minerals. Those are fantastic. I love the color combinations and uh, enjoying the tour of the candy store so far. Exactly. That's the way we want you to feel. And then here on the wall around the gallery, we have close-up photos of both candy and the mineral. So that's the old full Mrs. Candy, just to give people the visual connection between the two. And you have a soundtrack thing. playing things like My Boy Lollipop and I Want Candy and stuff <laughs> you know, like that. If you thought of it, you would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, we got here a Brazilian tourmaline with this vibrant red top and deep blue body. Wonderful color combination. And uh, again, it's that whole feeling of does it look like candy? Sure, it does, of course. <laughs> And as you walk around the gallery, here's a close-up of the tourmaline we just looked at and candy that sort of has that same red and blue feeling as the tourmaline. And in this exhibition, the piece that I think for me may be the most exciting, and I'm sure for Peter will be the most exciting, is the wolfenite from the San Francisco mine. That, I've always thought that looked like candy. <laughs> exactly. And, and this wolfenite is one of my favorites, if not my single favorite from that mine that's ever came, come out. Um, I, it's been on, pictured in books and posters and such. So I, I, you may, I have a feeling, Peter, you recognize the piece. Um, and this is the star of the show for me. How can you not love those specimens? I mean. Well, exactly, Lauren. That's the point is, is it's, that's where that whole candy concept comes from. I mean, everybody loves candy and these minerals. I, we feel like even if you don't know anything about minerals, you're gonna love these minerals. They're just so colorful and vibrant and fun to look at. Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to see what you've got in the other rooms. So in the other room, which we call the black room, um, the last time we did some video in the black room, the problem is it's dark in there and the lights blow the pieces out. So we're going to have um, some guys bring the mineral out to us and we'll show them out here where we can see them a lot better. And the first okay. piece I need to... is this, is this um, Brazilian terminal. It's from Barra de Salinas, but again, it has those colors that are just so insanely vibrant in the mixture of colors. And this is from a fairly recent pocket of about two years ago. But that's because that, that's that hot pink pocket, as it were. Yes, exactly. That's where it's from. That's where it's from. But, you know, it's just such a beautiful combination of colors and clarity and vibrancy. It's such a fine crystal. So this is part of the exhibition, which would normally be in the black room. Fantastic. Okay, let's go. Okay, Bob, we're going to let me say hello. Give me the stool. This is a really, really pure gem yellow anglicite. It's an old piece from Morocco. And this was actually interesting. It was once part of Erica Paul's collection. But just look at the termination on this thing. I mean, it's just, it's like cut glass. It's incredible. And yeah, it's, the fact that it's so gemmy and that color and wow i mean you literally can see through this crystal it's one of the finest anglocytes i've ever seen so this is uh a brandberg amethyst it's the light i think right? 
I don't think it, it, the lighting is doing this justice, but it's got amethyst from here to here, some smoky quartz, and then you've got these red hematites, which you probably can see right there. The, the good, good lighting, sorry. Over here. A very beautiful crystal, really. I mean, it's got these three colors, the amethyst, the brown, and then the red hematite. Just to give you guys an idea of, of what the office looks like, um, we have these cases along the wall where we display various minerals that are backlit with um, LED lights, although they're they're acting terrible on the camera right now. And then yeah. we keep <laughs> these drawers are partially filled with minerals. I'll just give you a quick overview. I mean, well, that was not. That was <laughs> this drawer is. So we keep minerals in here for collectors when they visit. And then, of course, we always have a couple of really, really special pieces like this one right here. And this is a smoky quartz with uh, pink fluorite from Switzerland. But just to give you some kind of visual idea of the size of this thing. There's the angle. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, there's the angle where you can really see how gemmy, on, on Zoom, where you can really see how gemmy it is. And with that absolutely adorable little hat, almost like a very 1950s lady, you know, uh, what were those referred to as? The, 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 the cloche hats? A cloche hat, yes. Uh -huh. very, I, I love how that's perched on top there. Yeah, me too. Me too. I think that, I mean, that's what really makes it, is that crystal right at the termination. Fantastic. And then over here, we've got this Russian tourmaline. And I know you guys are very familiar with these. You've seen them, but I think this is one of the best ones I've ever seen. It's mighty red. Yeah. It's super red. It's got gemmy tips. It's got a beautiful matrix. And what, what, I, what I think a lot of people... Uh, um, at first don't realize with these is that if you think back, how many truly red tourmalines outside of Jonas have we ever seen? And I think this find is is redefining in many ways the 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 red tourmalines of the world. Let's get marvelous. Here. Yeah, the terminations on this thing are just just stunning, absolutely stunning. It's a great luster too. It, it does it has super luster, and what from what I understand is that there are probably few to or very few left of these. I don't know if they're going to continue to mine them. From what I understand, the mining of these has really become too difficult. Hmm. Hmm. No, they're 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 marvelous things to have in the mineral world, and for us to appreciate. So, thank you for sharing that one with us. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And um, just to give you some ideas of what's here in the gallery, I don't, this is a, oh, the, I'm sorry, the LEDs just drive the camera crazy. We can't do that. <laughs> yeah. um, I do think that Irv wants to show us two or three special minerals as well. So let's get over to him and see if he's ready. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey. Hello, Irv. Looking forward to seeing what you've got your hands so carefully wrapped around. I can see some red so you know, far. I just moved to New York and my minerals are all packed up. So I'm here in the gallery and there's a few things that I have found that epitomize what I think is candy for the eyes and also exquisite minerals. This one just... When you think about the old Australian road knights and you see these new ones, these are so exquisite. They're on matrix, they're large, they're gem. But when you look at this under the light, I don't know if you can catch this or not. Road knight is pleochroic, so when you look at it from two different sides, you have two different colors. So what happens is some of the crystals are oriented with one color and one is oriented in another color. So you've got red, and then you've got this like pala paint tourmaline color. Can you see them? How are we doing? If we can keep the camera like stationary and then move the specimen relative to the camera, yeah, yeah, yeah. help a lot. There just, you yeah, go. Just... How's that? And am I close enough to the camera? 
You're pretty good. We're not seeing the pleochroism, though. Yeah, that's a function of light in here, unfortunately. The light that I had outside, I could see the pleochroism. That's and it was very the very ruins LED dramatic. lights. Exactly. We can, kind of we ruins that. The Which we, we can live with that color. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm okay with this color. Absolutely. You know what I mean? I mean, it looks good enough to eat. I mean, this looks like a piece of candy. It's fantastic, especially with that one large crystal off to the side and it kind of creates this V structure that draws your eye in. I How's love that. that. How's that for gem? I mean, I... And where's this from so that Brian can note it? This is from Brazil. It's from the classic locality. It's just uh, Lafayette. I think that's how you pronounce it. And... Um, They've never had anything like these series of pockets. I mean, this is like, you know, redefining road night. Mm -hmm. I mean, these look like large versions of the, you know, classic Australian ones. So there you like go. You, it looks like you crossed a road night with a sweet home road or pro site. That's exactly right. And what's a bit interesting is in the exhibit, there's a sweet home road or pro site next to this. And it you talk about candy. It wow. just looks like candy. I'm going to leave it on the desk so you get to enjoy. Can you see it here? Little now, pull it back just a little far. A little bit bigger. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. you might recognize it from the Walensky ad in the Melpitas issue. This one has almost it's as close as you can with a big, huge piece, the best of the electric blue. It's slightly missing it, but not much. I'm not sure what pocket it's from, but it is absolutely exquisite. You've got the large crystals. You've got the thin coat of um, azurite over the malachite, iridescent, just absolutely gorgeous. But this this puppy is probably 13 inches across. Can you see that good? Oh, yeah. Now, this piece in person is an absolute stunner. In photographs, you can't really get the reflections. You can't get the iridescence. You can't get the color. You can't get the contrast as well. But uh, absolute, this is one of my favorite Mel Pius. And it's not an Earth-style rock, but I just appreciate the size and the quality of it. And you have a couple of Mel Pius that I actually lost for too, Peter, just so you know. Oh, well, thank you. So there you go. There's that. And the last one, you know, I love tourmaline. So, of course, you got to have a tourmaline. <laughs> These colors, again. Can you see that? I'm going to come closer oh. to the camera, but this light actually can show you the really wonderful bicolor nature of this tourmaline from Brazil, and it's on Lepidolite. How's that look? It, it, is the green a, a, as grass almost vibrant towards lime green as we're seeing in the video? Is that, is that what you're seeing in reality? Warm light. Slightly less. It's a warm light, but I'll tell you, it's not far off. Mm -hmm. Wow. Here, and check this out. We'll give it, exactly we'll give it another light from. source. There's another light source. There you go. Oh, Look there at you the go. Oh, wow. cherry color of the tourmaline. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Talk about one that eats something. And, and where's this got, one from? Uh, what's the exact locality? The uh, Aracongama. Aracongama Ministerized. It also has some wonderful little, if you could see my finger, little jewel like crystals. And then you actually have some basically terminated crystals with it as well. But like second generation, it's just a wonderful thing. And, you know, I just love turmoil. Well, that's a that's a great piece. Again, Definitely it really lights up the screen. It, I'm glad it does, because like this is a first for me not being able to see what I'm doing. But it's just a killer piece. Just killer. Look at these three. Together with the vibrancy of the azurite, the red of the rhodonite, and then you've got the tourmaline. You got a rainbow on the desk here. Oh yeah! Just put that anglesite in front of those, and you'll have the full. And we'll have a rainbow. Yeah, we'd have a rainbow. Yeah, we should put the anglesite in front. We'd have a rainbow. <laughs> the uh, catalogs for candy um, will be out shortly. You can get them from the catalog. Um, I'm sorry, you can get them from the website. Also, after this show, I wanted to let everybody know in September we're doing something very special. 
we have our in-house designer, Antonio Pio Saracino, and he's actually designing mineral inspired furniture. So from September to the end of the year, uh, we'll be having chandeliers, tables, chairs, desktops, and other furniture that are look like crystals. And I hope everybody enjoys that. Okay, cool. Well, look forward to, to seeing it and uh, hearing about it and checking out those catalogs as well. As long as it's not a couch that looks like mesolite, it should be wonderful. <laughs> no, but we do have a chair that is uh, like a skull aside um, feel to it. Um, but thank you guys for uh, for watching and I hope everyone comes and sees Candy and the Furniture Show. And I'll see you guys up in Tucson if everyone's there. Sounds like a plan. Good luck with candy. Don't eat it all yourself. Wow, local crystal is really uh, up to their game this year. Who's that that I hear? Oh, hey. Lawrence! How are you doing, James? It's good to see you. Good to see you. Knuckles, it's the new official hand greeting of Tucson in the COVID era. Well, the, the I mean, knuckle bump. We, 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 we got to have some kind of secret handshake. That's right. You know, this little is the, elbow, a little knuckle. We'll, we'll all get in on it. But it looks like you guys have really put together a beautiful space here. We tried. We're really excited to be uh, over here in the new Tucson Fine Mineral Gallery. Uh, if you follow my uh, adventures on Instagram, you'll see that I drive all over the country and, in fact, all over the world. I went to Munich this year. Uh, we uh, acquired the Jim Poteet collection. Uh, these are uh, some beautiful pieces. Jim, uh, out of Bakersfield, California, just has exquisite taste. You can see his taste, very consistent, high, high quality pieces. Uh, so we're really excited to have these. We have um, <clears throat> been working closely with uh, Bruce Carter out of Hollywood, California. Yep. Uh, we have some of Bruce's pieces over here. Bruce also has very nice things. His collection is currently, uh, the core of his collection is currently on display over at the Rice Northwest Museum yeah. for just a little bit longer. So there's still an opportunity uh, for people to get out there and see it. And this is an interesting piece I want to kind of highlight. So uh, we've all seen Epidote uh, from the Prince of Wales. Uh, but this one uh, just has the crazy luster in a nice green color, and this was purported to be found in the 1930s by Ed Over. Really? Yeah, and I have tags going back uh, that look progressively older and older, so... So it, is this just Prince, this is just Prince of Wales Island, or is that Green Monster itself? Yeah, Prince of Wales, Green Monster Mountain. Okay. So it says, uh, one of the, one of the tags says that it is, uh, reputed to be from Ed Over's 1936 expedition. So that's a really special thing. And then I have a, a whole series of old tags. Uh, so that's that's a piece that I'm really excited about. Uh, this, a uh, bolt spurn, uh, is five inches on edge. Uh, it came out of the Harvard Museum. Uh, came out of the Harvard Museum years ago in trade. Uh, and now uh, we have it available uh, here on our shelves at the Tucson Fine Mineral Gallery. The magical thing about you know the the Boltzburn ones is they've got this, you know, in the, the way that the light transmits. There's almost this cranberry color that's created between the purple and the yellow zoning. Yeah. That's a huge specimen, yeah. and it's also so clean. Yeah. And crisp. I also was noticing this berlinite over here is really cool. Yeah, these are uh, hard to get in this quality. This is also out of the Bruce Carter collection. The nice thing, of course, about the berlinite is that they just transmit light almost like it's, you know, crystals that Superman throws in the <laughs> snow. And you also get to see this crazy etching almost aspect of it. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good thing. That's a really cool specimen. And we've also been working closely with Jim Gable. Uh, Jim uh, displayed uh, at this past year's East Coast Mineral Show. Yeah. Uh, he filled up the 53 cases, and uh, he has uh, somewhere between 750 and 1,000 specimens in his collection. And so what he's been doing is kind of going through 
where he might have duplicates um, and, and just uh, culling out some beautiful things. Um, the, oh. the color and the luster of these blues uh, with the tiny little uh, purple cores Really exceptional thing. It's almost like this fairy blue, like, you know, pastel, but with like a brightness to it. I, this is some of my favorite coloring in fluorite. And, yeah. and then this is uh, getting harder to get now. This is yeah. material from the Auglaise Quarry mm -hmm. in Ohio. Root beer fluorite and purple fluorite together in the same little vug. It's especially nice and sparkly and pretty. Yeah. And uh, this is a piece that uh, was dug out of the San Francisco mine mm -hmm. in the 70s by Wayne Thompson. Yep. With a nice orange mimetite. So we have, we have a, a, a pretty good variety, uh, great collections. Um, we've, uh, we've got some, some new uh, and exciting things. I'll show you a couple other pieces oh, yeah. from here. Do we have time? Sure. Okay. sure. This is a, a pargasite from Vietnam. Oh, look at that color. Yeah. I just Ooh. haven't seen one that has that, that aesthetic of the, the dominant focal crystal perched up at high noon, the great color, the great contrast. You know, there's just something about that grass green that it draws you in because your eyes go life and uh, yet here we have it in that in specimen form. Yes. Hey. Hello, James. Hello, Peter. Sorry to be late. Hi, daughter. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> oh, we were just discussing Too this Pargasite. I got that. So uh, we have some pieces out of some uh, Houston and Dallas collections, customers that we work with. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, that's called a yeah. necklace. Here, I'll dig that one out and let you hold it. I'll let you try it on. This goes into the discussion earlier that normally with the Jeffrey granites, you see, you know, the whole plate is covered and it's so nice to have, you know, unique singled out specimens. But here we get these trails. That is a... So flip it over. Is there a structural control on the trails that's evident? No. I see a little... Yeah, there's one there's there. One. Yeah. Is there one associated with this one? It might have been trimmed off. Oh, it might be over. Hmm? It might be in the rock that's not there anymore. This is true. But, but that one's pretty clear. Oh, no, you can see the, the end of it right yeah, there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous specimen, just the way, like... You have to choose which way you display it. I, I like it like a necklace. Yeah. You can see it sitting in a in a window in Tiffany's. Tiffany's wish they could have something that looks. That's like right. It. That's right. On the other hand, if you flip it the other way around, you have no standing up this way. There you go. Yeah, it's Snoopy. His nose and his ear <laughs> and his body. <laughs> And then I got a couple of neat things in the back I'll show you. Ooh. So these are pieces that just came in this week and I'll, uh, I'll show you a couple of neat things. So figured in Marshall Sussman's uh, book of his first, um, his first collection from Sumeb mm -hmm. is this Smithsonite with copper, which is crystallized copper from Sumeb is a little more rare. Mm -hmm. And this is figured in the book. So this is uh, part of the Bruce Carter lot that we got. Very cool. I, I love, love that the, combination. The, the, the mm -hmm. combination between, you know, the smooth, almost mm, silky aspect of the Smithsonite compared to the, the metallic and, uh, I'm trying to find a good word to describe it. but Roughness. Can, rough. Yes, you get the silky versus the rough. And yep. it's, it's a great combo. And then this I just found to be really hypnotic and interesting. Um, and I want to get Peter's take on this. This is one I call the Two-Face. So it's a Milpilus malachite after azurite pseudomorph. But then as you flip it over, it still has all these chunky azurite crystals. And if you look at this one, you can see exactly, I assume that maybe it was the, the water table where the pseudomorphing happened, but this crystal 
It's pseudomorphed on this end, but not on this end. Mm -hmm. Which direction is it going? I have two pieces of the same material, and I've pondered them extensively myself. Yeah, I think that's the, the magic of certain minerals that make us scratch our head and go, now how did that happen? Well, if you dig into the mineral science, azurite is... Uh, the, the cool thing about the difference between azurite and malachite is it's controlled by the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Mm. And as it turns out, that reaction sits almost at the pressure of our normal atmosphere. Huh. Malachite is just on the side that is typical of our natural atmosphere. Hmm. So to make azurite form, pressure has to be a little bit higher. Pressure of CO2 has to be a little bit higher. So it's very easy to see why malachite replaces azurite, because when the, when the pressure drops, malachite is favored, it replaces the azurite. When that process is reversed, Azurite grows, but it doesn't tend to replace the malachite. Hmm. So what you're looking at here is a specimen that was sitting right on that boundary. Hmm. And it grew, the whole thing grew under the higher pressure. And then for some reason, when the pressure dropped, only this side got replaced. You may be right. It may be a water interface. It may actually be that this was encased in something. Yeah, and that's so that, that part this, wasn't. This was what was accessible to the new fluids. But it's a wonderful moment in chemical time. Yeah. Frozen moment in chemical time. And and to relate that whole reaction back to something that's a little bit more approachable, maybe for some people, is the Sistine Chapel. People for a number of years thought that uh, Div uh, Michelangelo. Yeah, Michelangelo. Yeah. yeah must have been colorblind because the sky is green. We're like, what was wrong with him? And it was that he had used azurite as the blue pigment instead of lapis because it was cheaper. Uh. But over the number of years, it has had, has essentially pseudomorphed in place to malachite. So now you've Very got mm -hmm. the green sky instead of the blue sky. Yeah, so I call this one the two-face. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I just think, I think things like this, specimens like this that, you know, not the best color necessarily, not the best luster, not the biggest crystals. Oh, that's but a pretty great blue. It's a so cool blue. interesting. <laughs> yeah. Just so, so yep. interesting. Very cool. Yep. A wonderful piece. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, guys so much for coming in for the interview. It's always yeah. lovely to see you both. Good to see you and uh, nice to see you in your new location as well. Thank you for coming in. Hello. Nice to see you. Buongiorno. <laughs> buongiorno, buongiorno. Everything is fine, right? Oh, yeah. that's great. And it's especially great because we get to be here today to talk to you about what you guys have. And yeah. you Italians are always cooking up something special. Oh, thank you very much. We are so excited to be here. This year is a, a great moment uh, also to display some new stuff we had. We had a chance in the last two years to, to bring and to buy and to display in Tucson, so it's a great moment. This is our new place in the Tucson Familiar Gallery. I think you had a chance to travel a little bit. It's an amazing place. We love this place. So just to give to the people an idea of, war, of what uh, we are doing here, we have this main entrance with a couple of showcases of our interesting minerals. You can see something from uh, worldwide from uh, Italy to Myanmar, everywhere. It does look like you're in a dodgy neighborhood. Yeah, we have... <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> this is what we have as a neighbor. No, he's a great guy. We are very lucky. We are very lucky. We have a lot of fun. I don't know where he is. Uh, where he is? I don't know. Okay. Right here. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay. And uh, yeah, as you can see, we have some nice things for all the kind of collections. And uh, here is uh, one of the two rooms mm -hmm. we are using to display our treasures. So as you can see, also here, we decide to put uh, all the size of minerals, new find, some interesting slices. And as you can see, there are new finds as the Moroccan golds on metrics. Mm -hmm. But what I want to show you today, it's something interesting in this showcase. 
starting from something we love, especially, oh, yeah. Yeah, especially Federico, is a beautiful tourmaline from Elba. This piece, as you can see from the label, is very old. So approximately is from the 1850s, mm -hmm. around the 1850s. So it's a pretty old one, interesting because not repaired, not restored. And uh, there is this black termination. In my opinion, it's incredible. And uh, on these specimens, you can have also the bluish albite in the matrix. Mm -hmm. um, it's the earlier involved. stage here. And I love that the termination is almost a lilac color, right. right? It's got this purple pink and with the accent of that black cap. Yes. It really stands out, even in a case like this, full of yes. these bigger yeah. specimens. And we decided to don't trim it. A lot of people come through this room, say, why you don't make it a nice tumble or a little bit close to a miniature? Because you can but, see the matrix yeah. and what it we, tells you about the, it where is. it comes from. Yeah. And can you imagine in that period, this, um, this pegmatite was uh, worth only for collections. So they start digging to find these specimens for collection, not for, um, not to mine for uh, some companies for uh, gem. Uh, yeah, for gem or other things, just for collecting specimens. Wow. That is great. It's one of the first in the world. So it's interesting. I, yeah. I didn't know that about El the, the Elba locality. So that's yeah. it's a really fun Yeah, fact. it's very great. And uh, the other things I think is special here is this beautiful green. Yeah, this Russian big green dog. And so this is from the Dodo mine? Yes. In yes, Russia. In Russia. The wow. size and the quality, I think, make this piece very special. I have big hands, so probably looks smaller than it is, but <laughs> really, it's something uh, I love too. You mean if I hold it, yeah, do you have, it'll uh, yeah, yes, it? Yes, now it's a thumbnail, okay. <laughs> Here, let, let someone that's normal size hold the thing. We need a okay. kid who keep this. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay, now it's something reasonable. But uh, <laughs> what I like is uh, also um, uh, um, the things, it comes from uh, 50, 40 years ago. So it's something special from this locality I ever seen uh, before in this great shape and size, but uh, it's something unique, easy recognizable from the from the collectors. Mm -hmm. The Russian windows are supposed to be, the, to be the biggest. So it's very nice. It's only because they don't have windows in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that is true. So what's next door? I will bring you. Is uh, the second beautiful room. Wait, beautiful, beautiful specimens. Minerals. Yes. And uh, <laughs> here you can see some uh, more interesting uh, and geologically processed described by some specimens. And I think nobody will be better than Federico Pezzotta, who is <laughs> able to describe this species much better than me. So I think it's better to speak with him. What do you think about? Oh. Good? Always a pleasure to talk to Federico. Done. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. How Good are you? Too. Good to see you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. The, the most interesting mineral specimen in, or geologic specimen in the whole room. <laughs> Geologically yes. interesting. Sorry, I don't want to make you sound old, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, just uh, I'm here to hold down that position, so don't worry about that. Yeah, I just wanted to introduce uh, the, situa the geological situation of these two funny pieces, which are both from Africa, but uh, one is uh, an edgerine from Malawi, the other one is a lidicotite from Madagascar. What is uh, 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 what is happening in these two stones which uh, has some relationship. Uh, actually, these are two different geological environments, two different types of pegmatite. These are alkaline, these are LCT pegmatites. But uh, what was happening in these crystals uh, is a little bit, uh, was something similar. The edgerin, if you look carefully at the crystal, do, at the end of the crystallization, because of some shock, it broke. It, the two parts have moved, but uh, they moved not too much, enough to create uh, 
a crystallization of quartz, which actually is now sealing the two parts uh, in, uh, let's say, repaired in a wrong position. <laughs> and it, <laughs> Natural repair the stone, <laughs> but uh, not in exactly in the same position, so the two crystals are displaced. And it looks like the bottom section is slightly rotated as well, yes, relative exactly. to the, yeah, the... Probably the crystals fall down and uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can open to show better. Okay, and uh, and what happened here? This is a lidocratite. It was a large uh, cavity, like the cavity which was hosting the edgerin in Malawi, but this was a large cavity in Madagascar. Instead of prismatic elongated crystals of edgerin, in this cavity we have long uh, crystals of uh, lidocratite. Again, at the end of the crystallization, some shock broke off from the matrix, the crystal, the crystal fall down broken actually in two parts. One part and the second part fall down in the pocket. And another part, another crystal broke off from the matrix, fall down and went closer to the base of this crystal. And at the end, everything started crystallizing again and everything is rehealed. So this is now a doubly terminated crystal or a crystal which is recrystallized, fully recrystallized. This is fully recrystallized, this is fully recrystallized, and, and, and uh, some quartz and albite formed uh, the latest stage of uh, crystallization, uh, making like a concrete putting to the, together the part. When we collected this pocket in Madagascar and we found uh, these parts, uh, we were wondering what is happening here, wh why these two parts are not getting together. So we figure out uh, what was the story <laughs> of uh, the geological story of the crystal and uh, we decided uh, not to present the two parts as two independent pieces, but to put one after the other and uh, to, uh, to tell a story with the piece. I, I love how you have the, the base supporting it. It's one of those things where you look at specimens like yeah. this and you go, oh, I wish I could show how they fit together. And you've yes. done such a great job displaying that. And these are my favorite type of specimens, ones that are both beautiful and they are also this puzzle that makes you think and want to learn more about the deposits that they yeah. come from. Thank you. So Good. So maybe we can speak a little bit about the tourmaline slices. Yeah, the other room. that'd be great. So, I'm uh, a little bit uh, obsessed by tourmaline, unfortunately. I, I was going to say. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so <laughs> this is my preferred topic. So, so earlier you were saying you've discovered how many new mineral species this year? Or described how many new mineral species? Uh, I was show? involved in the description of uh, four new minerals uh, of uh, the tourmaline supergroup. Okay. And uh, so the tourmaline supergroup is expanding uh, uh, thanks to new research, new analysis, but also through the correct uh, application of uh, the modern mineral nomenclature. And so, uh, and uh, we have here a nice example of uh, Chris tourmaline crystals, which uh, uh, are always giving surprises. This yeah. is uh, some old stuff uh, found. I mean, this is not a new stuff. This is old stuff from Madagascar. And uh, these uh, five slices uh, are coming from a single piece. But when you look uh, uh, the, at the shape of the slices, yes, you can recognize more or less the roughly the trigonal uh, symmetry, yeah. which is obviously promoted and well shown by the pattern inside pattern of the of the crystal but uh, the rounded shape actually is related to the fact that uh, this was uh, not a crystal but uh, it is a pebble really? which uh, was eroded from which it was a crystal which actually was eroded from the mine and uh, bumped in the river and transformed into a pebble <laughs> pebble and uh, so uh, People in some localities in Madagascar and mostly in Al in Ten, which is uh, this specific locality, are finding in alluvial deposit uh, these pebbles in between quartz, uh, granite, and other pieces, and uh, and uh, they recognize that uh, these are pebbles of tourmaline crystals, and uh, when properly sliced, they show this uh, amazing. Uh, uh, 
interior pattern. The pattern is related, obviously, I don't want to speak a long time about uh, the uh, reason of this pattern, but just roughly I can say it is related, uh, first at all, uh, to the uh, symmetry of the crystal lattice of tourmaline, which is imposing a trigonal uh, appearance, and then uh, uh, by variations in uh, the composition of the crystal while growing. Each one of these areas is representing a phantom. If uh, we ideally uh, see the crystal uh, in transparency, uh, in three dimension, we can see all. F we could see all phantoms uh, uh, one after the other, recording uh, the uh, compositional variations during the crystal growth. So, given that compositional variation, presumably you could have three, four, five different members of the tourmaline soup yeah, exactly. in the same slice. This is what uh, actually I was uh, starting to say before. Uh, these are the perfect uh, examples of uh, samples uh, uh, in which uh, when you go analyzing in detail, uh, you can find uh, different uh, species of the tourmaline supergroup. We are, for example, if we work uh, on such a slice, we are are expecting to find uh, at least uh, lidiquatite or better fluor lidiquatite because true lidiquatite today is not yet uh, established as a species. Um, elbite, probably some manganese rich elbite uh, and uh, the dark portions could be an iron rich uh, uh, elbite or uh, it could be even uh, maybe a shawl or uh, some a similar species. And uh, when we go to these other slices, for example, we see a completely different pattern. Yeah. And uh, you can see that in this case you have uh, the skin of the crystal still preserved. These are sections of uh, a large prismatic crystal, sharp. Actually, this was uh, um, this was uh, collected in a totally different locality, in a primary deposit. And when you see this specific pattern, multiple with multiple uh, mm -hmm. zones, uh, actually this is uh, the typical pattern you find uh, in the uppermost part of the crystal, while when you go to this type of pattern uh, you are in an intermediate area of the crystal. So uh, having getting some experience uh, looking at the pattern of the slices, you can understand from which level of the crystal they have been cut. Wow. The, the fact that this was a cobble just blows my mind. And, and the, the story that the tourmaline slices tell when, the, when you have the passion that you do for tourmaline and it looks like you can read them practically. And not only are they beautiful, but what they present for, for science is also so important. So Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, a very complex mineral. Uh, but uh, on one side is complex, on the other side is uh, aesthetically fascinating. Yeah. Th this is maybe too technical of a question, and Brian's going to be like, darn your hide. <laughs> <laughs> but as you're seeing, like, the margins are getting more like this style here, where it's more, um, I don't know how to describe this, the... Is this complex, moving? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it moving towards the top of the crystal? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, uh, the pebble actually is representing uh, a significant section of the original crystal. So when the crystal broke off from the pegmatite and it was transported, uh, starting with being chipped uh, at the edges. Yeah. And uh, then started being rounded and rounded and rounded and uh, corroded in this way. And uh, but at the end, uh, you still have uh, the, the the major section or the major part of uh, of the crystal. And uh, so in this specific case, uh, you can see that uh, the five slices yeah. are representing different uh, sections, sections. Yeah. across the C axis of the same crystal. Very likely, this is the bottom. Okay. That's this is the intermediate, this is uh, the higher yeah. section and more 
high section and this is approaching to the steep termination of the so, so this would be like the top part of the purple phantom and exactly yeah. exactly exactly this is the <laughs> the, the top the part of the of the uh, purple uh, section and if we go down if we had the more section down we would have uh, a black uh, triangle expanding which uh, would represent uh, the ver the root of the crystal so how difficult or what technique do you use to orient the pebble so that you can get the axis right for making the slice this is uh, absolutely not an easy task you have uh, to use uh, your torch and look carefully, look at the striations. You can uh, still find uh, uh, along uh, the surface of uh, the pebble. And, uh, and sometimes it is funny because the pebble is rounded, but when you make some orientation, oh, oh, you so find oh, still so find <laughs> yes, some uh, rough yeah. trigonal appearance of the mm -hmm. pebble. It is super funny. Another interesting thing is that this pebble when you look in the field that they look completely black completely black you are not expecting that they have uh, such a beautiful pattern inside mm -hmm. and this is uh, remembering me a little bit when I went to Madagascar the first time uh, because I'm doing I, I was reading in books and uh, observing collection nice uh, color slices and I was always dreaming uh, how would this crystal appear and I was dreaming unbelievable colors and so on <laughs> but it is uh, a little bit uh, disappointing sometimes because when you look Look at these crystals. Uh, when I went to Madagascar and uh, for the first time I had uh, access to these large crystals, they were looking horrible, <laughs> brownish, uh, very dark. And the, at the end, it was totally obvious. All the colors are completely mixed. Mm -hmm. The material there, the crystal are very glassy, like this break like glass, actually, yeah. but they look dark. First, because they are very transparent and you look inside There's and no they are sure. big. And second, because uh, you have multiple layers of different colors. And when you have this, uh, the result in general is brownish or blackish. Mm -hmm. Wow. Fun games to play. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting because every crystal you cut and you slice is a, su a surprise. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, everybody okay. loves surprises, so yeah. thank you for surprising us. <laughs> thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your enthusiasm and all the cool specimens that you have here. I've definitely learned a lot and seen some absolutely gorgeous pieces, but thank definitely... You. Thank you. It's a pleasure of surprise, yeah. Okay. Always a pleasure. Grazie <laughs> mille. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Today. I'm doing great. Fine as frog's hair. <laughs> and I guess I want to show you a couple neat rocks. Yeah, I'm always excited to see new specimens. I'm especially excited to see what you guys have today because it looks like you've got some classics. I'm, I will concentrate on the classics. This is a copper from Cornwall composed of cubes, a cube composed of cubes. It's not like anything I've ever seen from anywhere else in the world. It was out of the Russ McFall collection, uh -huh. and uh, it's uh, unique. And it looks like there's almost a cast-like feature down here at the bottom, almost like one of those skulls that you see from Michigan. It is in and some ways. It's not uh, that mine is famous for crystals, okay. but it's not famous for cubes. This is such a cool piece, and the fact that it's from Cornwall too. Yes, and it's you know not yesterday's rock. This mm -hmm. is also a, a classic from Cornwall. This is. Galena after paramorphite. These came out in the middle of the 18th century, 19th century, I'm sorry, 19th but, century. The thing that seems to set this one apart though is, you know, I'm it, typically you see the, the, what do they call it, the, blue ore, right? Mm. Normally it's got sort of a... It's a coating usually. Yeah, but you don't see this sparkle aspect that we've well, got on this one. This is replacement then with a secondary micro galena on it. So it's yeah. really quite cute. Um, same age as the Rolleston copper but these are much more uncommon. You know, there's three of these localities, one in France, one in England, and one in Germany. Yep. So the hardest to get is probably the English. What Next else we got? A Bornanite twin group on quartz from the Herod's Foot Mine, also in Cornwall. Yep. This is a classic. I love these cogs wheels. I mean, there's just something so enigmatic okay. about them. Well, right? they're the first, and as such, they're the classics. They're the yep. Cadillac of Bornanites. 
Definitely. Although, if they're English, doesn't that mean they have to be the Bentley of Born and Knights? Uh, Rolls. Rolls Royce, excuse me. This is a very classic mineral. Every, almost everyone is aware of the calcite twins mm -hmm. from Cumbria. This one is very nice. It was in the Smithsonian collection. It belonged to a fellow by the name of Jack Jago Trelawney. I'm not sure which side is best, but it is, without a doubt, a perfect butterfly. Yeah. It's what everybody wants if you want a butterfly, except one that floats. <laughs> so just a simple calcite. This is from also northern England, from a Cambuck Keel's mine. But it's a lot like the uh, Chinese stuff, these yeah. little coolie hats. But I love how this one's set up where you've got this nice V that draws your mm -hmm. eye up to the edges. and. This was in Lindsey Greenbank's collection. It was in Ralph Sutcliffe's collection. Again, it's a, a piece with some history. Yeah. Most of the Cornish and English pieces I have are, have some history to them. Yeah. Well, they, they have to because they came out a long time ago. They came out a while ago. The silver's from Alva, which was the national mint for Scotland when Scotland was, a, was its own country, not part of the United Kingdom or England. Oh, wow. And uh, th to my knowledge, this is the largest known specimen. Doesn't mean much, but it is very large. The little bit of pink to it is probably erythrite. Okay. But they minted their own coinage for over 100 years at this site. It's the only silver site in Scotland. Yeah. I love the feathery texture. Well, it's a lot it's... like bought a I was going to say, it, 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 it speaks to my uh, one of my favorite silver localities. <laughs> so, so you've got to love that delicate, almost delicate, dainty yes. aspects to them. This is new, and it's got some history to it. This is a, obviously a red cloud wolfenite for anybody familiar with yeah. Arizona minerals. And this, this is Garth Brickers? This is Garth Brickers. Garth died a few years back. Yeah. His wife died suddenly this year, oh, a few no. months ago. And uh, this is one he self-collected. It's a very pretty piece. Um, extremely bright. Yeah. The, the luster and the fact that it's so gemmy towards the edges mm -hmm. there and so, in the center in some of them. And then I'm not going to handle this one because it's heavy. The large piece is also from Garth Brickers' collection. Yeah. And it's, uh, the crystals are sitting on sort of a white smear of calcite, which really lends contrast. And gives you that little extra sparkle. Sparkle. Actually, yeah. the specimen really sparkles in general. And what else? Well, this is out of Karis' collection. She's deaccessioned de this. Mm -hmm. It's a scoridite from Ma Pimi. Oh, yeah. It's got that good blue color. And of course, like all of these, you know, if you could take them outside, they just... They just blow out outside. Yeah. And this is a big specimen for Mopimi. Yeah. Um, actually, I owned this specimen about 40 years ago. And it, it sold it to Bob Reynolds uh -huh. in California and purchased it back. So... It's and, a, and, and it found its way to, to Carrot because Carrot went yeah. pretty in yeah. Mexico. Mine! Mine, mine. I was also noticing that there was another one of the... Have these become classics now? The, the yellow... Well, I don't think they're classics, but uh, they're bright yellow. They're bright yellow from Ojuela, and they've got such a different character compared to, say, the, the San Pedro Coralitos the Sandra, because... These you, are crystalline balls. Yeah, and, and the texture just reminds me of something from underwater and... Yeah, they're very much coralloid. Yeah. And. It's just a nice large specimen. We mostly like smaller pieces in our collection of Mexican yeah. minerals, but it's impossible not to have some larger ones. Yep. This is a recent find from Tanzania. This is an Alexandrite twin. Oh, wow. And it's on matrix. It's one I've had to clean to bring it up, but put a light behind it and you'll get some real good color. Oh. oh, my dad and his light is... Uh, <laughs> That's all right. Missing. Take my word for it, will you please? <laughs> <laughs> this is a classic, also not a recent piece. This is copper in calcite from Michigan from the UP. The, the terminations are perfect and natural and uh, actually doubly terminated in both cases, in this case anyway. So a wonderful specimen for the species. And a good size and, and, and perfection, which is rarity. Yeah. And this is recent from Tanzania. Oh. This is a quartz. Just originally came to me as scapolite. Uh, hard to believe. But so I, so I had it tested several times. And it's still quartz. 
sadly, but the form is remarkable. Yeah. It's uh, highly etched. It's sort of a bicolor. Don't see color well, but I think this is two colors. Yeah, there's a, there's a yellow to one side mm -hmm. and a tree clear to the it's other. It's like it just decided to be two things. This is out of Karis collection. This is a azurite on quartz. From Concepcion del Oro. Concepcion del Oro. These are not super old. They're probably 60s and 70s is when most of these came out. But most of, most of them, long before any of us were collecting. Yeah. Or wished we'd been collecting. Or we're alive. In certain directions, it's got a Milpius blue. Yeah, no, because it's because it's that thin film of thin the azurite on the on the pseudomorph after the pseudomorph. Oh. Right there. Yeah. And it was a Kareth piece, so it's just yes. adorable. And the other Kareth piece that we love, liticodite slice that's fully terminated. Wow. And this is one that she bought in 1984 on her first trip to Europe. Really? And so she decided to get rid of it, sell it, but it holds a lot of memories for both of us. Yeah. It's it's one of the things piece. that draws me to minerals and many people is when yeah. you find something that's moderately unique. It's like, here's this vug, what else, <laughs> or geode, what else could you call it, of shatakite. Wow. I mean, I'm not sure how this was collected, but it seems to be all the same mineral. That's out wild. Of, and it's like it was almost in a water course left this behind. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, several times I thought about cutting the bottom off and putting the light in it, but that would be sort of non-mineral. Yeah, not, not non-mineral friendly. Although it looks like you might have some pockets that you could stick like a single LED into. Well, it's very chatoyant. Oh, yeah. Especially here on the edges. See, on the, well, I suspect that all broken edges would be the same way. That's true. Mineral collecting started essentially about 500 years ago, but it really hit its height during the Victorian time. The English were really, really aggressive collectors. <laughs> and there was a book written called Robbing the Sparry Garniture. It's a great and, book. And it's a classic. But in there, there's a letter that complained about the fact that one collector had ruined the value of minerals by paying 50 pounds for, for Kongsberg silver. So I'm thinking things have not really changed over that period of time. <laughs> well, of course. I mean, that's, that's one of the, the beauties. Prices of the will continue to go up. Exactly. Collectors will continue <laughs> to complain, and dealers will continue to pay more. There you go.